14th board meeting. Uh, we began this afternoon with a workshop in which we talked about um, our solar panels. We had a second workshop that we tabled in the interest of time. And so now we are in open session and I'd like to begin, oh, and we were in closed session in which we talked about employee issues. Um, we're going to move on no now. No action taken in closed session. I'm sorry. Close, we just I need to report if any action was taken oh, and there was no, no action, action taken in closed session. Thank you. Always learning. Um, and so now we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance and I'd like Mrs. Catulli to lead us, please. And now we are moving on to um, an explanation of our executive work of our workshop. So, Mrs. Galicia, would you like to share that? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this evening, Mr. C.J. Nolan, Director of Facilities, Maintenance, and Operations, presented a solar update workshop. Mr. Nolan reviewed the final eight schematic solar site plans, which will be presented today for board approval. The final two sites to be finalized are Oak and McGaw. We anticipate their final location plans to be approved by the next board meeting in eight, on April 27th. Our second uh, workshop was scheduled for today. Measure G, upcoming project and cash flow, was tabled for a future board meeting to be due to time constraints. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're on to reports and recognition, and I'm going to begin with my board president's report. When I first started teaching at McAuliffe in the early 90s, teachers were stunned and in awe when each one of us got our first Mac computer in our classrooms. Many of us got, of us got up at the crack of dawn at the start of every semester to get a head start on the line to sign up for that prime time in the computer lab so that our students could get their five days a semester allotment to work on research papers. What a different world we live in today. Now students have access to individual devices in almost any class on any given day of the week. Technology has opened up whole new avenues for instruction. However, all these advances would be, would be uh, I'm sorry, would present insurmountable challenges if it were not for our incredible tech department under the stellar leadership of Director John Sparados. The Information Technology Department is dedicated to providing the highest quality of techn technology services district-wide. The team helps facilitate and achieve the district's priority goals by providing secure and dependable technology for students, teachers, and staff. The IT department works collaboratively with the school community to implement and maintain technology standards, provide curriculum support, and build partnerships that continue to enhance technology use throughout the district. This past year has been challenging for all of us as we've navigated through the pandemic and the state guidelines. The following procedures and achievements were accomplished by our amazing, amazing information technology team to support the instructional models of all students. 4,500 new Chromebooks were purchased and deployed for hybrid and less out at home programs since the start of the pandemic, which added to our current inventory. New virtual less out at home schools and tradition, in, traditional in-person schools were created to support distance learning and hybrid teaching models. All of this basically because we have such a great tech department. Nearly 4 million copies of take home packets and booklets were created by our district Repographic Center for students across the district during distant learning. Nearly 3,000 Chromebooks were checked out to students in need of a device for less out at home and asynchronous hybrid learning while at school, or while at home. Nearly 200 hotspots were purchased and used for students and families to check out who did not have internet access. Over 300 speakers and, and mic headsets and webcams were deployed to teachers and staff to help facilitate teaching and meeting in a remote setting. And for all of us who've coped with these masks for over a year, you know what a strain it is on, a, on your voice. Think about teaching all day long. These speakers and mics saved the teachers and allowed the students to hear every word. 
320 sound amplification systems were distributed to teachers to provide ample and clear sound while wearing the masks and live streaming. The district Zoom and Google Enterprise capabilities were upgraded to allow a secure method for instruction and meeting for students and staff. Instructional aides and an intervention staff also received laptops, Chromebooks, to help students and families with instructional support. The district's Microsoft Teams were upgraded to assist instructional aides to support their students in remote situations. And I was on a conference call uh, with a lot of other um, board members from different districts, and so many of them to this day are struggling to get the hotspots and struggling to get devices to their students. So we've been very fortunate. Work orders, support calls, emails increased approximately 35% the past year during the pandemic. They had a lot to deal with. The district's audio and visual technology was upgraded to support live streaming and recorded sessions of board meetings to our family and community. Every part of what I've shared has only worked because we have an incredibly dedicated and resourceful team in our tech department that never considers new challenge to be an unsolvable problem. While they're researching, problem solving, and finding new answers, they're also innovating, training, guiding, and supporting staff, teachers, and families across the district. We, the board, wish to express our sincere gratitude to our heroes in the tech department we thank each one of, their, of you for your brilliance, your dedication, and your heart. We want to send a special thank you out to Director John Spratos for his dedicated leadership, as well as to Robert and Beckett back there, who are back in the booth for every meeting, not only making everything work for all of us who are present, but also providing a means for families to watch the meetings from their homes. Tech Department, you have our true appreciation and thanks. Thank you. Thank them. Yes, thank you. And now we're, going, we're skipping the student report, and not because it isn't wonderful. It's always a joyous part of every, every board meeting. But our student rep is out touring the country, checking out all the colleges that have accepted him, figuring out what his final decision will be for the fall. So, Nico, we miss you, but we're, we're very excited to hear what you've decided when you return. And now we're moving on to our superintendent's report. Well, I must admit, it's always easier to do my report when I'm not following Nico. Uh, he's, he does such a, a, a wonderful job, and we do miss him, but that's what we're about, about really trying to create unlimited opportunities for students beyond uh, high school, and that's really what he's seeking out there uh, along with his family. So good evening, Madam President, esteemed members of the board. I am proud to present my superintendent's report for this evening. And what I really wanted to be able to focus in on is um, some of the instructional programs that we're going to continue to be providing and expanding uh, over, over the summer for our students. Uh, one of the things that I think we have continued to be diligent upon is to be able to provide extended learning opportunities for our students even during this pandemic and trying to find ways, whether it be through our reading lab or through Griffin Virtual, um, just different ways to provide as much support as we can to our students. And I, we know that they need uh, more um, with the reduced instructional minutes that the state put upon all um, public e education systems this year due to the pandemic. So I want to talk about the summer learning opportunities for students that, that are available, particularly. Um, I'm really proud that we continue. We'll be offering our summer academy. It will be an in-person summer school program. And I want to talk a little bit about each of those programs. So for kindergarten through fourth grade, our summer school, or what we really call our summer academy, is going to be June 28th to July 23rd. Um, our summer academy will be at Los Alamitos Elementary School, so all of our students will be there. And it really is an opportunity for continued instruction and application of grade level skills. So if you are a first grader, you would go to the first grade um, program, getting ready for second grade, et cetera. It is highly prescriptive in reading and writing instruction, along with targeted uh, math intervention with a strong focus on number sense, fact fluency, and problem solving. What I am so thankful for as well is that we continue to have our teachers who do such an amazing job all year long, many of whom who are still willing to give of their time. Now, they're compensated, so it's not, um, but, but wanting to give of their time to devote to our students to be able to provide this additional learning opportunity um, for our students. 
So in fifth grade uh, and at middle school, we really have kind of two different programs that we will be providing for our, for our middle school students or those getting ready for middle school. And that'll be uh, June 28th to July 23rd. It will be at McAuliffe Middle School. And what I love that we've been doing the past few years and we're gonna continue to enhance it is what we call our summer bridge for fifth grade. So for some of our fifth graders who really need um, a little bit more extended learning opportunities and some targeted areas to help them bridge successfully to uh, the middle school. And so with the opportunities for the summer bridge and they get to even be on a middle school campus during, during the summer uh, is really to the exposure of a format of a middle school where they really will have two period, a two period schedule. Um, prescriptive reading and writing instruction, and then proactive support for math six and math six, seven. So those students can get any more foundational skills necessary to be successful and ready when that course picks up uh, August 16th. And then also uh, embedded within it is a focus on study and organizational skills within that fifth grade bridge, which we all know is really important. So we also have a summer bridge for sixth and seventh grade, and that's really our, our summer academy for sixth and seventh graders. It's again an opportunity for continued instruction uh, along with study and organizational skills, but it focuses in at seventh and eighth grade with a focus on humanities. So using the humanities and a his, his lens of history, social science, but focusing on reading and writing. So you're kind of getting a, a little bit of blended approach there. And then in math, again, a two period uh, section, math and STEM, science, technology, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And for our seventh and eighth graders, it's focusing on, on the lens of math, but through a lens as well of science and technology. So our eighth graders, you'll notice eighth graders are not there because our eighth graders are going on to Los Alamitos High School. And so similar to our fifth grade bridge today, um, we have a what's, what we would call a ninth grade bridge. And it's really in a few of the areas to help our students be successful in some courses that to get them uh, stronger foundational skills in algebra, in biology, which is a ninth grade course as well, typically, and a humanities ninth grade bridge. And so these are opportunities um, where they get exposure to Los Alamitos High School um, teaching staff. It's once again, two periods of instructions offered from 725 to 10 a.m. Period two is 1015 to 1250. The dates are up there as well, the 28th of June through the 30th of July. It's a little bit longer uh, period than our elementary. And the Algebra One Bridge is really trying to uh, help students be successful and be ready uh, to take algebra in ninth grade. So it's continue mathematical practice so that they can be successful in that. We do a biology bridge as well. And it's an introduction to some of the key vocabulary concepts and coursework so that as they take biology as a ninth grader, they have some foundational skills for those that may need additional support. And then a humanities nine focus, which is really focusing on reading and writing through the lens of history and social science. So I love that these are opportunities that we have provided. In addition to uh, at the high school, what we've continued to offer is credit recovery. So any student who received a non-passing grade in an academic course, they can enroll and retake that course through the summer credit recovery program. Courses are offered over three periods of instruction. In fact, some of them through, the, through our skills lab are even offered some nighttime um, opportunities or evening opportunities. So our skills lab, uh, excuse me, our high school credit recovery dates are similar to what we just saw with the ninth grade bridge. They will be at Los Alamitos High School and it's June 28th to July 30th. And we even typically break it out down into semester one and semester two uh, over the course of, of the summer. Additionally, we are offering an extended school year intercession, and that's really for students uh, preschool through adult transition program. Um, it's available to students with, with special needs who are uh, eligible based upon their individual IEP program. And so the intercession for ESY, or it's often abbreviated by extended school year, is June 28th to July 23rd. Uh, and they'll be at several different locations. So if, you're, if they're pre-K through, um, they'll be at Weaver Elementary. Kindergarten through fifth grade, our ESY intercession will be at LAE, Los Alamitos Elementary School. Our intercession for ESY at the middle school will be at McAuliffe Middle School. Our intercession um, at 912 will be at Los Alamitos High School. And then our adult transition program, which is here at the district office in our adult transition classroom, will also be here um, for that. So a myriad of opportunities to continue to provide in-person uh, instruction and educational support that is available to our families um, 
to meet the needs um, within each program. And then what we're constantly hearing and wondering, and we too, uh, as we've been waiting, as we continue to monitor all the guidance is, the, I think the million dollar question I've said all, much of the half of this year is what our families really wanna know is what will next year look like? Um, and so we did send out communication to our families uh, right before spring break that, uh, and I'm really pleased to be able to announce uh, once again, that for the 2021-22 school year, we have every plan to return to a complete full day traditional in-person instructional model at all of our schools, at elementary, middle, and high school. Um, we will continue to, it'll look much like uh, our normal school year has, and unlike this year. Uh, we would have recess and lunch during the school day for students. We will continue to, to plan to be able to provide transportation options for families. That really was not available to them this year through the myriad of the hybrid schedules. That has been a significant impact on our family, so I'm pleased to announce that we'll be having uh, transportation, just like we would in a normal traditional school year. We will continue to adhere to any of the guidance that is set forth uh, and imposed upon us by the California Department of Public Health. Weaver starts August 4th, and all of our other schools start on August 16th. The one question that I still get from a few families, not too many, is will we have a virtual option next year? And that is still to be unknown. We have explored a few different options, but the only reason it was available to us this year is the state legislature had to approve a virtual option. Um, normally they did not approve that for, for public school systems. And so we don't know where they're gonna land on that. Um, and so we'll have to wait and see. But right now we're uh, fully planning to return all students to a full day traditional in person. And I think that's pretty uh, exciting. And then lastly, I just wanted to reflect upon um, some of the things that have been going on in our community. And I know we'll have various public comment, which I actually, and I know the board does as well, we really welcome public comment. I think it's important for us to be able to hear from diverse perspectives and people who agree or, or don't agree. I think that's really what makes our makes us an amazing democracy and, 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 and country is that we do have our freedom of expression and the, and the ability to dissent as well as to agree. Um, in, in, a, in a civil matter. So I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But, but I do know there's also a lot of misinformation that is out there. And one of the things I'm probably most proud of and, and uh, appreciative of is the incredible hardworking and dedicated work of our deputy superintendent, Mrs. Andrea Reed. I think, uh, I don't know of a finer assistant superintendent, let alone a deputy superintendent of educational services in the myriad of ways that she has continued to provide leadership. Along with our TOSA, uh, Nadia Williams, who, you know, um, out there in the community, there's been different flyers going around, which um, people are, are, have the freedom to be able to do so. But um, calling for some individuals resignations or to be removing, to remove Mrs. Uh, Reed or to remove Mrs. Williams that I just don't support. They have my complete support as superintendent. I'm sure that they have the complete support of the board, but I won't speak on behalf uh, of, of the board. It's interesting. I personally, and I'll only speak for myself, I don't believe in council culture. And it's often some of the same individuals who say they don't believe in council culture are, are trying to write a petition to remove individuals who are doing work not from their own political agenda, but work that the board has directed staff to work on. The board has given us a direction um, over the course of the last year to implement an ethnic studies course. Um, we've taken a look at how we can continue to enhance human relations and through, through a myriad of different lenses. And I think there's a lot of falsehoods out there that, that aren't accurate and a lot of misinformation. Um, even when people say that ethnic studies is, they use the word synonymously with uh, critical race theory, it is not. Um, and so there's a lot of broad strokes that are, that are taken out there. Um, but I just really wanna commend the, the, the work uh, of Mrs. Reed, of Mrs. Williams. Sometimes the work that we do is hard and, and even if it's not in something that's aligned um, with everyone, it is the work that we've been charged to do and they continue to do it with grace, with dignity and really trying to reflect the values that we hear from all of our individuals. Um, 
And I do, I really do appreciate hearing dissenting voices and those that are in support, but I think at the same time, we have to make decisions that we think are in the best interest. That is really the goal of the, the job of the board. And then we will take direction from the board to then uh, move forward. But I wanted to reaffirm my strong support and appreciation for Deputy Superintendent, Mrs. Reed and uh, Ms. Nadia Williams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pulver, and you are absolutely correct in, in noting that the board is very proud to have Mrs. Reed as our deputy superintendent, so thank you for your work. Um, we're now moving on to a, a celebratory moment in the evening when we get to have a school give a, a school and student report. And tonight, we're, we're very honored to have Weaver represented, and Dr. Todd Schmidt is going to begin that presentation of, of the report of their school and their students. Welcome. You're good. You're good. Thank you. <laughs> He's got uh, his gear. I, I, you are ready. Seriously. Wow, this is great. Okay. Well, good evening, Madam President, esteemed members of the board, Dr. Pulver, members of the cabinet, and the entire We Are Weaver community. My name is Dr. Todd Schmidt, and I am the very proud principal of Weaver Elementary School. Teach, lead, love. Three simple words that have had deep meaning to the Weaver community as we have embarked on a year unlike any other. As we started the year, we hoped that these three words would define and guide our journey as we look to continue the tradition of excellence that embodies the We Are Weaver experience. But it was more than just something for the staff. Those three words were our hopes for our students as well as our community. I am excited and humbled to share how this year has unfolded and how teach, lead, love became more than just a theme for the year. First, let's spend some time on how the teach portion encompassed our classrooms, our school, and our community. The teachers and staff of Weaver Elementary are simply extraordinary and have risen to the challenge of finding ways to emphasize signature practices with rigorous and relevant instruction while maximizing learning time in both the hybrid and virtual low cell at home programs. While following health protocols, our teachers continue to find ways to meet the needs of our students, differentiating the instruction, and finding creative ways to provide additional time and support for struggling students, both academically and social emotionally. From creating STEM challenges to utilizing technology to enhance collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking, I am continually amazed and impressed by how our staff members have realized that many past practices will need to be modified and recalibrated to do what is in the best interest of our students. Our teachers have explored how educational technology is an effective tool to both enhance student learning and teacher efficacy. During our monthly staff meetings, teachers share new tools they have discovered that have emphasized the importance of frequent checking for understanding and student collaboration coupled with creative and critical thinking. In addition, teachers have used their free time to participate in virtual live professional development opportunities. And in fact, this spring, 18 teachers are diving into a hands-on deep dive with John Carippo, the co-creator of Edu Protocols, lesson frames and strategies that give teachers more class time and increase student engagement. We have even extended the teaching to our parent community as well, knowing that the struggles our parents, like parents all over the country, have been facing with the challenges this pandemic has brought on the social, emotional, as well as educational progress of our children, the Weaver PTA, through a partnership with Dr. Jerry Weichman from the Weichman Clinic out of Hogue Hospital, supported and funded live virtual six-part series on parenting in a pandemic. Dr. Weichman has offered counseling, strategies and best practices in everything from screen time to mental health issues that have arisen due to isolation and anxiety. As we move into the lead portion, you'll see how leadership opportunities were offered, encouraged and supported in our staff, students, and families. This past year, we have seen significant leadership in the areas of culture and cultural awareness at Weaver. Through partnership with Danielle Nava Maharas, the district's human relations coordinator, and Nadia Williams, our teacher on special assignment for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Weaver formed our culture committee. 
a committee made up of parents and staff members with the purpose of finding ways to celebrate and highlight the diversity and the cultural backgrounds of the families that make up the Weaver community. For example, organized by several parent volunteers, we recently celebrated Black History Month in a variety of fun and educational ways. We had our first Black History Family Night where we read and watched the short film based on the book, Hair Love. We also learned about the colors associated with Black History Month and our students were encouraged to dress in one of these specific colors. Throughout the year, we have had read alouds, videos and classroom lessons that have highlighted Women's History Month, Autism Awareness Month, Asian American Heritage Month, and we are getting ready for May, where we will have events to highlight and celebrate Speech and Hearing Awareness Month. We were even able to come up with some new ways to celebrate traditional events at Weaver, like our New Year celebration. Families who recognized and celebrated the Lunar New Year were encouraged to share photos on social media of their students dressed in traditional garb, through the ingenuity of our culture committee, we were able to expand that celebration to all students with a red envelope that not only contained information about the Year of the Ox, but it also showcased and celebrated a female Chinese artist who had designed the U.S. commemorative stamp for the Lunar New Year. Former Weaver alumni also made huge contributions. One former student was the creator of the insert for our red envelopes, and several former Weaver students recorded Lunar New Year read-alouds, that were shared in our classrooms. Student leadership abounds at Weaver with our amazing ambassadors program. Led by Lisa Gambo Alevi, her team and our teacher advisors, fifth grade students have the opportunity to improve themselves and their community. A culminating component of the program is the CARES Project. Students divide up into teams and find an organization or an individual that they would like to support. Despite being in a pandemic, our ambassadors exceeded all expectations and found multiple ways to bring smiles and happiness to so many people, while at the same time engaging and soliciting help from the We Are Weaver staff and students. From collecting snacks for our superhero frontline medical workers, to organizing a food drive for the Grateful Hearts Food Bank, to writing 102 birthday cards for a Rossmore resident celebrating his 102nd birthday, our ambassadors showed true leadership character and community mindedness as they set out to make a difference in the world around them. One of the challenges we have faced this year was in the replacing of events that have become the cornerstone of our programs and highlights for our students. One in particular was outdoor science school, which our fifth graders look forward to each and every year because, but because we could not send our students to OSS, we decided to bring OSS to our students. Not wanting to add even more to our teachers' overflowing plates, two of our parents, Dr. Sue Shea and Mrs. Vicki Vu, took the lead and collaborated with our PTA to create OSS in a Box, a series of lessons, activities, and events that would ensure our fifth grade students had a week of memory-making experiences. Through collaboration with the district office and the other five elementary schools, we had everything from geocaching to actual snow. From Gaga Ball, to archery, to photo collage walks and interactive steam and music lessons. We even had the Rajalingam family from Blaze Pizza donate all the materials for all six elementary schools to be able to build solar s'more ovens at the end of the week. Especially this year, there was a significant need to be intentional about finding ways to spread empathy, encouragement and love in our school, our students and the community as a whole. Based on John Wooden's pyramid of success, each month we focus on one of the blocks of the pyramid. And at the end of each month, our teachers nominate one student from their class to be recognized as their student of the month. We create a Google slideshow video each month that announces the recipients in each class. I then go into each class to personally congratulate the recipient, give them their certificate, bumper sticker, weaver goodies, and the piece de resistance, the yard sign so that the community can know how awesome each child is. Families are encouraged to take pictures of their child and share it with me, either via email or social media, so that our community can celebrate right alongside our recipients. While we applaud and recognize citizenship and academic achievement, we are also taking the time to celebrate and honor character, because it's not something that can always be taught, but rather developed. 
One of the areas that we have emphasized this year is in the need for connection, both with our hybrid families as well as our families currently in Los Al at home. Throughout the year, we have created a variety of family events meant to build community spirit and connectedness. For example, during Halloween, in partnership with the Raja Lingam family and Blaze Pizza, we had a do-it-yourself monster pizza and banking party where students took home kits and built their own crazy, scary, and delicious pizzas. As Halloween is such an important event on any elementary campus, several parent volunteers came to campus the night before Halloween and created an amazing Halloween event complete with a scavenger hunt to find the monsters hiding in trees and bushes, coupled with two Halloween backdrops that allowed students and teachers to dress up and get a socially distanced class picture. It may not have been the annual parade, but our students had so much fun nonetheless. Another way we hope to build community and connectedness was through events that students both in hybrid and at home can participate in throughout the year. For example, during the holidays, we celebrated the 12 days of Chrismica with several holiday-themed dress-up days. In addition, two great events were the family holiday flip hunt, where families submitted videos on Flipgrid, completing a series of holiday-themed challenges, as well as our monthly Facebook Live bedtime story with Dr. Schmidt, complete with a special guest elf reader. Okay, it's not going to start yet. Okay. As many of you, have, as you may have noticed, the We Are Weaver hashtag is used in all of our social media and school spirit wear. But I was curious if our students understood its importance. For our student report, I asked several of our fifth graders, what does We Are Weaver mean to you? Here are their thoughts. I think We Are Weaver means to be courageous, helpful, Hopeful. For me, We Are Weaver means a place where you can trust everybody, from teachers to parents to volunteers to your friends, no matter where you are. We Are Weaver means to me is to be smart, confident, inclusive, and kind. But also, I think it means that you're fearless, confident, and determination, because those are the things all students have to show while they're learning from their teachers. To me, We Are Weaver means that we are different and unique in our own ways, where we come together as a community to share our hobbies and what we are interested in. What We Are Weaver means to me is that we are unique, we are hardworking, and we overcome challenges that come our way. I think We Are Weaver means having responsibility, respect, and kindness. To me, We Are Weaver means to be positive and to always be nice to everyone. To me, We Are Weaver means that although everyone is unique in their own way, we can join as a safe community for the students, teachers, and other staff members. And that we should be the best we can be and try our hardest to get everything done. The We Are Weaver hashtag means that we are a great community and that we work together to make a great learning experience for all students. To me, We Are Weaver means a community of people working to know What We Are Weaver means to me is an amazing community know that if you are feeling upset about something that someone will be there to help you. To me, we are Weaver means that we are all one giant family, like this one big family. We are united as Weaver whales in one big pod. We are Weaver means to me that I have an amazing school family and that they will always be for me whenever I need them. Once you're a Weaver well, you'll always be a Weaver. And that part is very true. Thank you so much for allowing us to share the incredible things happening at Weaver Elementary as we look to make teach, lead, love our mantra for this school year. As we build on this in the coming months and into the next school year, feel free to follow us on social media and be sure to follow the hashtag We Are Weaver to share in our story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. Mrs. Hill? Dr. Schmidt, how are you this evening? I am so good. Thank good, you. Good to see you. So I love what you're doing with Coach Wooden. And um, <laughs> are you aware that he also wrote some children book, children's books? Yes. In fact, the uh, the person who wrote Inch and Miles um, is, has actually been a guest speaker on our, um, has done virtual videos for us as we've introduced the different blocks on the campus. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. You bet.
Dr. Forehand. Dr. Schmidt, I just want to say uh, prior to taking my position on the board, I subbed at one of your classrooms, and I was the lucky recipient as a sub of having you come in and read aloud to the kids. And I don't know if you even knew I, who I was at that time, <laughs> but your enthusiasm... And I think I told you that I went home remembering my favorite job was elementary school principal. And you exemplify leadership and your staff. They're incredible. I, wa I can walk to Weaver, as you know. And I was there today, in fact. And when I walked home, I just am in awe. But the best part is I walk by those signs in yards about characters and I smile because those kids, it's so much fun to see some of my neighbors being honored. So thank you for your leadership and thank you to your wonderful staff. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you for telling me. Great presentation. Really appreciate it, Dr. Schmidt. We always love hearing um, from our uh, principals and the staff and see what's happening at the schools. <laughs> And especially this year, yes, we're finally getting to be able to go back into the classrooms if the teachers are comfortable with people tromping through now at this point in time. And I have not made it yet to Weaver. Uh, I, am, I am finally, somebody canceled, and I get to come go later this <laughs> month. Um, so whoever canceled, thank you on the board. Mm. Um, but I just really want to say that um, that is where the magic happens. And it's, all, it's the best thing that you can do is to go into one of our elementary schools and walk through and uh, Weaver has, is outstanding and very innovative, and it's the leader. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Schmidt. I've known you a long time. You've always had tremendous energy, dedication, and passion for education. And I think anybody who walks through the school sees how the incredible instruction and how kids are learning. And from this presentation tonight, I, I really deeply appreciated a time when we as parents or grandparents and community members have a deep sense of concern for the well-being and the joy in our kids' lives. That They've lost a lot of that opportunity to be with other kids and, and have fun and do good things. And you, you're covering all the bases. The love part, I, I, lo I celebrate the joy in all the activities you do with them. I thought the Halloween, looking for the monsters in the tree was, I wish I would have been there. And then, uh, and most of all, I really thank you for teaching them how to give back to the community and pick the organizations that they want to work with and be really dedicated from the heart in what they're doing. So thank you for everything that's happening on your campus for the thank heart you. and the minds of our kids. So thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. Um, now. If I may just add. Oh, sure. Uh, as a very proud superintendent uh, as well. I, I just think the Weaver staff, Dr. Schmidt, uh, the Weaver community, the parents um, are just exceptional. And uh, this year dr during the pandemic, the, our ability to be able to provide in-person instruction, one of the earliest uh, I think the earliest that, that I'm aware of at the elementary level, but also why we've been hyper-focused on, on those uh, during our hybrid instruction on English language arts and math that we haven't forgotten. And I think just presentation and the Weaver staff um, really personify that along, along with all of our staff, that it's more than just the education. It, it is the developing the whole child, the social emotional aspects, the, the bringing joy to, to coming to school, um, the, the, the love and the connection with one another. And so I just really want to thank our, our teachers who have gone above and beyond. I love seeing how they even are doing additional professional development and, and through uh, the edu protocols. But even um, our fifth graders who are taking active roles of community service and uh, trying to make this community better by thanking um, various individuals. And that would not be possible, and particularly our, our healthcare workers, without our ambassadors at, uh, and our parent community and our and the very creative parents who also found ways in a in a year where we can't have where we have to limit non-essential visitors to be able to still come in after hours, et cetera, to decorate the campus, to still find ways to celebrate and acknowledge um, our, our, our kids and the experiences of what elementary school is supposed to be about. And so uh, it really is something that, that, uh, that I think is something to, to be celebrated, along with how we've found ways to really make even those families who are been, who've been in our Los Al at Home program, our virtual program, still feel extremely connected as a weaver whale. So I really want to thank uh, that that's not done by accident. It's by, done by a series of intentional actions by the entire staff and the parent community 
Um, and one of the things I often say, and I truly believe, is that the hallmark of this district are the people, and that really is indicative here of, of our parents, of our students, and our staff making it what it is. So thank you to the entire Weaver community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pulver. And now Dr. Schmidt gets to do a special celebration honoring someone dear to the heart. Yes, I do. All right. She's so happy about this, but it was great when you, when you mentioned specifically the Halloween portion of it. It just was, this was perfect for this. So this year, Weaver Elementary is honored to recognize Dr. Sue Shea as our hero of the heart. More than just a parent volunteer, Dr. Shea works tirelessly behind the scenes to help Weaver Elementary be so successful. As our PTA president, Ruth Ann Kirchin said, Sue approaches every challenge with a deeply held belief that nothing is so big that it can't be solved with a cricket, a balloon arch, and a laminator. <laughs> After watching her in action for the last few years, I think she's right. Sue's volunteer work and commitment to the Weaver community is unparalleled, and her humble service is always done with both a kind heart and a dogged, unwavering drive. She is motivated entirely by her desire to provide our staff, students, and families with what they need, when they need it, and bigger and better than anyone could ever imagine possible. She nails it every single time. Sue truly epitomizes what it means to be the hero of the heart, and the Weaver community is better because she is a part of it. One of our teachers affirmed all this when she said where to start. Yearbook, Winko's Extraordinaire, OSS Goddess. Like a ninja, she comes in and makes copies and preps for us, and we never knew she was even there. Never asking for recognition, she's just there to help, all while working full time too. These sentiments are so true. Dr. Shea is always ready to lend a hand or figure out a way to make something extraordinary happen. With this year presenting so many challenges, Sue has gone above and beyond to bring a sense of normalcy, a sense of adventure, and a sense of community to our school. She's been instrumental in putting together our yearbook and helping run our site copy center, affectionately known as Winko's. But even more so this year, Sue has done an amazing job ensuring that some of our traditions and events still happen, even if they have to be altered slightly. One of Sue's greatest contributions this year was with the creation of OSS in a Box, a series of activities that both our low sal at home and hybrid students can both do both at home and on campus, spending countless hours working with an arborist, an astronomer, and a biologist, Dr. Shea, her team of parent volunteers, and our teachers put together highly engaging and fun STEAM activities that our students and families are still talking about. She was even willing to share all of her work with the other five elementary schools so we could have an incredible experience. We are so grateful to have Dr. Shea as part of the We Are Weaver community. As one parent put it, Sue is the epitome of dedicated and selfless volunteer. As a Weaver mom since 2012, there isn't much she hasn't done for all students, families, and teachers. I have witnessed slipping into Winko's at 10 p.m. to make copies and fix machines. She has stayed up until 6 a.m. counting and recounting pictures to make sure every child is included in the yearbook. Her helping hands in elevated fifth grade promotion, OSS field trips, fifth grade activities, Halloween activities, back to school kits, kindergarten welcome kits, just to name a few. What is impossible becomes possible with Sue. She puts every effort to make it work and make it right. Thank you to Dr. Shea and her amazing family for all you do and continue to do for Weaver. You embody, teach, lead, love, and you definitely make Weaver a great place to learn. Congratulations. President, esteemed board members, Dr. Prover, community members here and those watching online, I am honored to receive this recognition that comes with the award. First and foremost, I wanted to acknowledge and thank my husband. Without his support, patience, and the ability to ignore the mess in our house, I would not be able to volunteer and do what it is that I wanted to do. Earlier in the year, I wasn't telling him why I was leaving the house at odd hours, 
preoccupied with upcoming events, purchasing odd items, or getting home late. And he jokingly asked if I was having an affair. I very seriously said yes. <laughs> it's with Jack L. Weaver. I also wanted to thank my kids. With their support and especially their ability to be independent, my kids have given me the opportunity to give back. When my oldest started at Weaver, I tried hard not to be a helicopter parent and volunteered so that I could be in the know but not hover. And through the years, it's been a great place to learn about the teachers and the curriculum and everything that the school has had to offer. And when my youngest started school, he told his teacher that my job was at Winko's. I remember looking at the proud smile on his face when he saw me at Winko's as he told his classmates, that's my mom. And I knew I couldn't disappoint him by not volunteering. I also wanted to thank Dr. Schmidt, the teachers and staff at Weaver for allowing me to volunteer. Weaver is a great place with amazing teachers and staff. It's provided quality education for my kids. And it's this excellence that makes it easy for me to volunteer and support the people who have enriched the education for not just my kids, but all the kids. The pandemic has certainly turned our lives upside down and made me appreciate family, friends, and giving back to others. Having our kids attend school in person has helped us to hold on to some normalcy. And volunteering or supporting the school in whatever way uh, we can has been part of that normalcy. It takes a village to raise children, and I want to acknowledge the village that has supported me, made it fun, and allowed me to be able to volunteer. From the teachers to the PTA and Friends of Weaver board members, to the night custodians that let me onto the campus, to the other moms and dad volunteers that are there along with me, and my in-laws who always make sure our family is well fed, I couldn't do what I do without everyone's help. So thank you again for this award. I'm proud to be a part of Weaver in the Los Alamitos School District. We are truly better together. Thank you. Thank you. Would, so would you like to introduce your family? We've, we've heard wonderful things. We'd love for you to introduce them. Come on up. Come on up. This is my husband, Ivan. This is my oldest, Sienna. She's at um, McAuliffe in eighth grade. And this is Kayla. She's a fifth grader. And I have Bradley, who is in first grade. Well, we thank all of you, because we understand the work she's doing does take sacrifice from everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to do pictures after this. Thank you. Now you get to give another award. I do. This has been a great night for Weaver. All right. Logan, you want to come on up here, buddy? On every school day throughout California, dedicated educators and courageous students overcome tremendous obstacles to reach their goals of academic success, excellence. Their success is our success. Their powerful stories are our inspiration. The purpose of the Every Student Succeeding Award is to honor students who have succeeded against all odds, beyond expectations, or simply won the hearts of the administrators and other educators who helped them achieve their goals. The We Are Weaver community is honored and excited to recognize one of our recent alumni, Logan Hakala, as the Every Student Succeeding Award recipient for the entire Los Alamitos Unified School District. Each year, Logan has gained more and more confidence. Oh, oh, I thought he moved. Okay, sorry. In his ability to actively participate in class, build lasting friendships, and be a leader that other students want to follow. For example, he took part in our ambassadors program where he learned to hone his leadership, empathy, and community building skills. 
We saw Logan be willing to take more risks and put himself out there, knowing that he may not always be as successful as he would like. By the time Logan left Weaver Elementary School, he'd become a confident and caring young man. Logan's courage, the support of his team, and the strategies he has learned have helped him overcome the challenges he has faced. We are so proud of the young man he has become, and it is a testament to the power of partnership between his teachers, the support staff, and the family that Logan is now thriving and succeeding in middle school. Here with us tonight are several members of the Logan, uh, sorry, of the, yeah, of the Logan Hockla Fan Club. They're all right over there. They're, they look at them all, <laughs> right around there. The teachers and staff who partnered with Logan and his family established positive lines of communication and worked collaboratively to see this young man soar. Congratulations, Logan. On behalf of the entire We Are Weaver community, we know that you will continue to do extraordinary things, inspire all of us along the way. What's exciting about this award is this is an award really from AXA, which is the um, Association of California School Administrators. And uh, here in Orange County, each school district gets to represent or nominate one student who's overcome uh, both challenges and remarkable odds for, for success. And so on behalf of AXA and our Region 17 here in Orange County, uh, Logan is our uh, Every Student Hero of the Award. I want to thank all of the our staff and our administrators at Weaver that helped um, nominate uh, Logan as well as his family to continue because we know it takes a village to help people to be successful and we love celebrating our students. So Congratulations, Logan. Congratulations. Congratulations, Logan. We're going to take a brief recess so that pictures can be taken of all of these wonderful people. So if you'll, are we doing the pictures in the foyer? We'd we'll like to take uh, our pictures of our hero of the heart and our every student succeeding. Um, we'll take it out in the foyer out there. The lighting's a little bit better. Once we're able to take pictures, um, then we will come back and continue. So probably a recess for about five to 10 minutes, probably about Thank 10 you. minutes.
Welcome back after a short recess. We are going to begin with uh, community participation. Due to the large numbers, we will need to decide whether we're going to extend our 30 minute time. So I'd like to hear from the board. I move that we extend our um, um, time for so that everyone can speak. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. We, in the earlier meeting, we had to reduce the amount of time for speaking because we had time constraints, but we're willing to stay till midnight, I guess. So anyway, welcome. We appreciate everybody here who's uh, come to share their views. Our first speaker will be Sean Shuck, and then after that, Claire Kirkigen. I'm probably saying that wrong. So welcome, Sean. Just, just while we're, we're waiting, I do want to remind the public that uh, they do have three minutes. The microphone will go mute at the end of the three minutes, and the buzzer will stay on until they're done. We're going to ask you to finish the statement there, just to be sure that we can have uh, ample time for everybody who came who wishes to speak. And what uh, Board President Mrs. Davidson will do, we'll call up the person two people at a time, the person who'll be next, and the person kind of, if you think of it, as on deck, because they might be in the overflow room, and so they have time to be able to get over here as well. So thank you very much, Mrs. Davidson. Thank you and for the clarification. We'll turn and it over to our first okay. community um, Welcome, Sean. participation. I haven't done this since I was the student body president 21 years ago, so <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> Life comes full circle. Uh, thank you, board. My name is Sean Shuck, and I come in dissent to your decision to maintain school closures through the remainder of the school year. The problem statement is simple. Children of all ages are negatively impacted by not going to school. My first frustration is lack of consistent decision making by the district. A June 12th email from Dr. Pulver shared that 63% of parents voted for an August 31st school date. School started August 31st. In August 26th, the email states that 77% of parents selected to send their kids to traditional pathways. 77% of parents felt comfortable returning to school. Then on March 30th, Dr. Pulver's email states, school would remain in a hybrid setting in complete opposition to the majority of the parents, 65% who voted to send their kids back to school. What was the difference about the opinion of the parents on March 30th, June 12th, or August 26th? Do the voices of the parents only matter when it's convenient for the board or for the teachers? My second frustration is the use of guidelines and data only when it suits your agenda. I spent a year reading Dr. Culver's email stating CDC guidelines, facts about COVID, safety, culminating reasons why my kid can't go to school. The March 24th survey email indicates the six foot restriction was lifted and the new guidelines were a recommendation for three feet. In fact, on March 19th report, the CDC states in their school reopening plan that quote, Evidence suggests that many K through 12 schools that have strictly implemented prevention strategies have been able to safely open for in-person instruction and remain open. After 12 months of stating that guidelines and facts drive decision making, the board has once again decided to use data solely when it fits their agenda. In reality, my child's a six year old first grader and will be fine when we exit COVID. My wife and I founded and operate a nonprofit where we provide college scholarships to underprivileged high school seniors in Denver, Colorado. We spent the past week reading their applications filled with stories of loneliness, assault, and raising their own siblings during this pandemic. It's those children you're failing with this decision. There's reported increase in mental health issues and suicide attempts by children during the pandemic. It's those children you failed with this decision. Women and underrepresented minority families have been dramatically impacted by this. It's those children and those families you've impacted by this decision. Lastly, on March 30th, your email stated you will not open school and the primary cause, and I quote, parents shared how they already altered their work schedule, arranged for different drop off and pickups and secured childcare op options that would cr create disruption and challenges to the family. Board. That's what we do as parents. We put the best for our children. We sacrifice. In closing, your ever-changing decision-making process, use of data and government recommendations only when it meets your agenda, and pandering to the minority show an extreme lack of leadership. Thank you. Okay.
Claire Kirchian, and then the next speaker will be David Rist. Hello, my name is Claire Kirchian. I'm a student at Weaver Elementary and an immensely proud Weaver Whale. Congratulations to Miss Sue and Logan. Yay! But I'm also a military kid, and that is why I'm here this evening. April is the month of the military child, and this Thursday, April 15th, is Purple Up. For Military Kids Day, purple is the color you get when you mix the colors of each of the branches of service. When you purple up, you can do it for all military kids. My father, Bob Kirchin, is commander in the Navy Reserve and has most recently served in Afghanistan and now leaves his reserve unit based in Hawaii. Just this school year, he's been away for more than 10 weeks. When a parent serves our country, so does the family, especially the children. My brother Jack and I are proud to serve, but sometimes it is hard. We miss our dad very much when he's away, but we know we are not alone. There are military kids in our school district in the Los Alamitos Joint Forces Training Base, the Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station, and those who have parents who are in the National Guard and the Reserves, like my dad. We are a school district with military kids, and the active duty kids really need our support and our thanks. So why am I here? I'm here to ask the members of, members of the Board of Education to purple up for military kids at your next meeting. Please wear a purple shirt, a scarf, or a dress, or even a jacket. Send a message to military kids in Los Alamitos that you support them. Also, I asked Mr. Nico to please highlight Los Alamitos High School military kids in his next presentation. I am sure they are there. I would also like to help plan a bigger celebration next year so the entire school district can purple up too. Will you join me please? Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And Claire, thank you for reminding us that when one family member serves, you all serve. So thank you so much. Mrs. Davidson, just if I can, um, our IT in the back, if they can help, our three-minute timer it goes straight to the yellow, and our speakers might want to see the green, yellow, red. I don't know if there's a way to adjust this for them. I just want to help our speakers. Sure. And in just a minute, our next speaker will be David Rist, followed by DJ Rist. I um, know you need just wait a second. They're going to try and see if they can get the lights going. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fair. It puts me in the right place, though. Go ahead and maybe start off at Yellow. We'll try to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been here. I've spoken more than once. Today, my son's going to speak. I hope you guys hear the parts that matter. Um, I heard you guys say you stand very strongly by Reed and Nadia, and uh, I appreciate that. I just hope that doesn't negate some of the messages and some of the communication that a lot of the communities had. And I do agree there's a lot of misinformation, and I want to extend my thanks to Ms. Reed. I got to meet with Nadia Williams and Ms. Reed today and ask some more specific questions about the social justice curriculum. And today I ask before we get to the voting in May 11th, I hope the board does their research. I really truly hope they do the research and I hope they're not distracted by what a lot of people do and I've talked to a lot of families where they see social justice and they instantly go, justice, it's good. The author of the social justice curriculum that I see you guys are presenting from tolerance.org, which was authored by Louisa Derma Sparks, if you just Wikipedia her and follow her and where her chain of thinking and what this is kind of coming from the Poverty Law Center, it really worries me. And I've been involved now since I first heard about the ethnic study, and I had a real open mind. I'm like, hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully what they're trying to do and talk about isn't indoctrinating or isn't trying to put certain ideas. And I've just learned recently, and it breaks my heart, we've actually lost a family that was taught a lesson from Nadia that showed you know, a certain subject through the certain lens of how to identify some of these aspects of the curriculum and it really worries me and it really worries me that we're having this up to vote when it's already being implemented and it's really kind of confusing and I think that there's a lot of problems we need to address with our children with our school that are happening right now but I don't think this is the curriculum that we should choose in our district because it's too wide open it's too frothy it's not real it doesn't really give the teachers an avenue to go back and say this is how you should handle this and I don't think it's really 
um, our place in a lot of ways to, to really decide what a kid should decide, whether it comes to gender, sex, religion, or justice, or any of those social aspects that are really big topics right now. And I think we could do a better job as a district in doing our research and looking into where is this coming from. The Southern Poverty Law Center, if there was no hate, we would have no Southern Poverty Law Center. And they breed money and they make money off of hate. And so I think we really need to look into some of the subject matter that you guys are choosing to task Reed and Nadia with, and it's not the best. And even today, I was really offended when I got to talk to Nadia, and I asked her about whose job is it to decide if my seven-year-old son decides to identify as autistic? And she instantly said, she, he needs to. That's not her place. And I see those are the kind of issues that we're going to run into where we're going to have a lot of people at conflict rather than resolution. And I think we need to focus what we are really good at in this community is unity, education. We do great in testing. Our numbers show it. But I really think we need to watch what we're trying to get involved in and find out what's really driving the SPLC to put tolerance.org and this whole curriculum in a lot of schools already without vetting what the real agenda is or what they're trying to portray. Because I think our principles and our basic, you know, Thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, DJ Rist will be our next speaker, followed by Luke, who's a student without talent, whose last name I don't know. I don't know. Hi, my name is DJ Infante. I go to McAuliffe Middle School, and I'm here to talk about social justice, racism, and political views. From my, from my point of view, I am seeing and hearing that they're going to start teaching social justice at kindergarten, but why? I have that question because many are so young and don't even know what racism is. I, have, I also have a brother that has autism that's in first grade. And why would you teach him these ideas and not let the parents teach it? If I'm being completely honest here, I believe that teaching social justice would just force personal ideas on students rather than teach them to develop their own. Also, why add something when school is hard enough? And when they get home, they already have lots of homework. My brother works harder than some fifth graders before, after, and during school. Again, the question about social justice is why teaching in elementary school? So about racism, I hear and see a lot outside of school and in school. For example, I'll be walking down the hallway and I hear someone say, pick my cotton, or, ra or say racial slurs, or don't whip me, master. But joke or not, it is not okay. So going to political views at school and my own. At school during Women's Month, I noticed that there were, there were not one Republican, some of the women on the walls being Michelle Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and Kamala Harris. And during Ability Awareness Month, Joe Biden was on there for a speech impediment a day after. But did you know that Trump had ADHD? Why was he not on there? Why are my beliefs not represented? Also, during Women's History Month, there could have been some Republican woman being Candace Owens and Melina Trump. So next year, there'd be awesome if there were Republicans also representing. Also, I feel like they're trying to push their political view on us. Finally, I'm gonna talk about my own political views. I am Republican, Christian, and want to stand up for its right. I am not just Republican because my parents are. I've done my research. I, don't, I do not want to go too be, deep into that. So back what I was saying on my political views. I have been called racist, homophobic, and white privilege, which I don't understand why, because I have a different view. My heritage is American, Hispanic, Native American, Italian, and Irish. And I believe that everyone should be treated equally. I have been raised to love and respect everyone no matter what. Also, I don't believe there's such thing as white privilege. Th thank you all for listening to my speech. My name is DJ Infante, and I go to McAuliffe Middle School. Thank, thank you, DJ. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Our, our next speaker is Luke, followed by Harriet Reed. Hello, my name is Luke Alexander, and I am currently a sixth grader at McAuliffe Middle School. I have some questions as well as statements about introducing this very flawed new curriculum. Firstly, I must ask, how will this be taught to children? If I am correct, the basic of, this new, of these new ideas is to say that white people are racist and America is systematically racist. In my opinion, this cannot be farther from the truth. I do not support some groups such as BLM and Antifa. Does that make me a racist? Because according to this new agenda, it does. 
Obviously, this is divisive. So with that in mind, why would it be taught in schools? As a person who has friends of all races and all colors, I doubt that any of my friends would consider me a racist. So why are the school's teachings going to call me a racist? Another question I have is, will this have a focus on white privilege, AKA the idea that is by definition, literally oppressive towards minorities? By definition, quoting the Merriam-Webster dictionary, white privilege is, quote unquote, the set of social and economic advantages that white people have by virtue of their race. When reality, that could not be farther from the truth. We've been taught from our kindergarten ages that anybody could be anything as long as you set out for it and worked hard. To my beliefs, this is true, unless in modern day America, you are white. I guarantee you didn't see that one coming, but this is true. In Oakland, if you are one of the 10,000 white families living in poverty, you will receive nothing, as only families of color will be getting $500. Also, even on the school level, colleges are getting more funding and more money for hiring and enrolling people of color into their systems. With this in mind, why are we teaching this when even on the school level, this is false? Will we be learning about these injustices against white people or only those on people of color? I believe that during the modern era, we have made tremendous advancements towards equality in America. Although I believe that with these ideas being taught, we are moving backwards by instead of stopping racist individuals who can be of any race, color, or ethnicity, we are only hating on white people this makes me wonder, are we actually trying to stop racism with this, or are we just pushing it on another group of individuals? I must also ask, how will this be taught to the younger children, for example, K through five? Will they be, have to learn to be called racist for their entire, entire childhood without evidence? They shouldn't have to, as it wouldn't, wouldn't it be bullying to make false claims on a student? Not, this is paradoxical to the idea of this new curriculum as neither me or any of my white friends are racist. Lastly, I have been called a racist, homophobe, and idiot for no more reason than wearing a MAGA hat. I've spoken out about this multiple times and as far as I know, no one has been punished for this. Although if a minority student came up saying that I had been mean to them for their BLM attire, I would probably be suspended in an instant. With this in mind, why are we teaching our young generation non-factual claims that harm many of these children? Sincerely, Luke Alexander. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Luke. Harriet Reed, followed by Denise Miller. I'd like to speak from the heart. I want to let you know that uh, I heard that uh, some people are saying that there were misconceptions going around the community. And I think that the misconceptions, um, I, I don't see truth as a misconception. I, I think that the problem is that there are people who believe that this is going to be the, the, the course you're proposing is a constructive ethnic studies course, and that's not what it is. It's a critical ethnic studies course, and there's a big difference. And the difference is that the latter is uh, the background of it, it's seen, it sees everything through a critical lens. And, and when you say that we don't have the, the curriculum, so how could we be upset? The slides that were shown in the board meeting listed Christina Sleeter. Christine Sleeter, and this is what she wrote in her blog on March uh, 31st. Recently, we have witnessed white people in several states, including Michigan and California, protesting restrictions designed to prevent the uh, spread of COVID. Some of these protests include not only white people wearing MAGA hats without face masks, but also some carrying Confederate flags, nooses, and guns. As Haley Branson Potts and Chandria, somebody in uh, Priscilla Vega noted in the LA Times, I don't know why anybody's still reading that paper, but anyway, the overwhelmingly white makeup of protests is not lost on people of color, some of whom see it as an overt display of privilege. And she goes on. So Miss Leader, in my opinion, is really, she's a racist. I mean, she sees everything through a racist lens. And I think that's wrong to teach children that. You've heard about the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center, that, that organization that creates hate maps and puts every Christian group on their hate map. So now you have 
children in school who might be a part of those groups who are part of the hate map. So are they going to get bullied because they are part of um, this uh, group that's a Christian group, I don't see how that solves any of our problems. I really don't think it's solving any of our problems. And I think if all the parents took a time, a little time, to dig past the surface and look at Christine Sleater and the gentleman she wrote a book with called Tolteca Cotton, his last name is C-U-A-U-H-T-I-N. These people are, are just racist. And I wouldn't want my child taught from a book written by either of those people. So when you look under the surface and you see the slides that were put up, that it came all from your information. It didn't come out of the blue. So I urge the board and the rest of the parents to please take a look at the materials that you have thus far presented, whatever they are, and see the writings of those people because they really are not people who are trying to bring people together. They're racist and divisive. Thank you. Um, our, ne our next speaker is Denise Miller, followed by Barbara Kapinch. A little shorter. Good evening, President Davidson and honorable board members. I will begin by saying that I'm in complete agreement that the time has come for an ethnic studies course in our district, and that I trust the LAUSD Board of Education to do the hard work of looking at all the options for curriculum for such a course. I appreciate that the community will have ample time to review the curriculum and offer opinions about it. To those who say we should focus on math, Gains in math and science grades are seen among students who participate in ethnic studies courses, according to Stanford Center for Education. Critical thinking skills are developed, and student outcomes are improved, which surprised me. The dispelling of myths surrounding history in my community and in my country is not to be feared, but should be welcomed and celebrated. My neighbors have contributed to the building and blessings of our country, yet our educational system has minimized or distorted their experiences for generations. Ethnic studies courses are not to be feared as rewriting history, as some suggest. Rather, as proud Americans, we should be thrilled to embrace all of our history. In conclusion, I thank you for I thank you as you begin the challenge of assembling the outline of this first but important step in creating an ethnic studies course and in the preparation of an honorable way in which to train our educators who will be leading such courses. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Kapint, followed by Rick Walzer. Yeah, it's me again. Kapinoche is the pronunciation. Um, I was looking through, I, I drilled down into the curriculum, and I am assuming since all of you, the, the curriculum has gotten this far, that you, di you did too. Um, I've spent about eight hours on it, and literally it's probably a 60-hour job to go through all of the lessons planned, driving down into the text questions, even the answers for the text questions that the students, they are, or the teachers are told to steer the students if they give a varying opinion. That's very disturbing, most of which would be the race and ethnicity topic. As mentioned before, it states all white people must be convinced that they're racist and oppressors. They cannot help it. They were born that way. That is, and and the w one woman that uses the analogy of the French language, the kid grows up speaking French, he can't help it. She likened it to racism. Opponents to critical race theory include many in academia. Farber and Sherry published the Harvard Law Review, argue that CRT lacks supportive evidence, relies on an impulsive belief that reality is socially constructed, rejects evidence in favor of storytelling, rejects the concepts of truth, and merit as expressions of political dominance and rejects the rule of law. 
In addition, they posit that the anti-meritocratic tenets in critical race theory, critical feminism, and critical legal studies may unintentionally lead to anti-Semitic and anti-Asian implications. In particular, they suggest that the success of Jews and Asians within what CRT theorists argue is a structurally unfair system that may lend itself to allegations of cheating, advantage taking, and other such claims. You've got to look into this. A series of responses to F Farber and Sherry was published at the Harvard Law Review. These responses argue again that there is a difference between criticizing an unfair system, which I think we have at times and in places, but it is different from criticizing individuals who perform well inside that system. Imagine the difficulties the kids face just developing as kids, like these kids have spoken tonight, you know, just dealing with growing up, not taking into account that they're being indoctrinated to believe that they are racist oppressors. How will this, these kids speak up for themselves in a classroom that is so intimidating and an environment that will expose them to shaming or bullying if they voice a differing opinion or they're being told to steer back to the point that the teacher wants them to take? Well, what toll will this take on the child's psyche? Critical race theory employs bullying to teach anti-bullying and racist tactics to teach anti-racism. Thank you. Um, um, our, our, next speaker, our next speaker is Rick Walzer, followed by Hunter Dunn. Everybody should go to californiaschoolchoice.org. I'm reading a letter to the editor by uh, Dr. Barkey, MD, dear editor, as a former 12-year elected member, I can't breathe, <clears throat> of the Los uh, Alamitos Unified School District Board of Education, it is very disheartening to watch the, whoop, to watch the school board put so much time and effort on an elective ethnic studies course rather than focus on mandatory math and English. Yes, one can walk and chew gum, but apparently not very well at Los Al. There are already dozens of electives at Los Al School, High School. Ethnic studies should already be addressed in U.S. history and the social sciences as all of our American founders were from a foreign country, ethnic. Mine are from Germany. When all of our students <clears throat> of all ethnicities have at least met and better yet exceeded math and English test results, only then should we consider feel good courses. If the ethnic studies course focuses on minorities, let's look at the California Smarter Balance 2019 results. Math, nearly 20% of black students and 14% of Hispanics have not met basic math requirements. Seems to me that's a pretty good place to focus on. At the high school, over 40% of all students are below grade level in math. Amazing, 40%. That's a pretty good target area. And then English, just over 12% of black students and eight and a quarter percent of Hispanics have not met basic English requirements. Reminds me when I tried to hire good people that knew how to write and it could add. Uh, until all students, and especially minority students, have met or exceeded math and English requirements, the basic needed to succeed in college and advance in the working world, elective courses like ethnic studies are a distraction from the basic three R's mission of education. Sincerely, Jeffrey I. Barkey, MD, co-founder, Orange, Orange County Classical Academy, a free public charter school in Orange County. Thank you, thank you. Our next speaker is Hunter Dunn, followed by Denise Inouye.
Hello, my name is Hunter Dunn, and I'm a senior at Los Angeles High School. I'm involved in and I care deeply about this community, um, both that of our school and of Los Angeles as a whole. I'm a head president of the show choir program. I attend a local church, Seacoast Grace Church, if you guys know where that is, and my Eagle Scout project was to build a buddy bench for Hopkins Elementary School. So as a student as well as a concerned citizen, I have to ask, why are we spending weeks on such an easily resolvable issue? The facts are clear. Stanford University did a study that showed conclusively that when a high school introduces an ethnic studies course, this is correlated with an increase in GPA, graduation rates, and college attendance rates. I think we can all agree that we want to create the best environment to produce smarter, healthier, and more successful individuals regardless of race, class, or creed. The other facts are clear as well. Racism still exists. White privilege is a real thing. The National Bureau... <laughs> So laughs the people citing AMAC, an actual hate group. Thank you. Um, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the government, and this was under Trump's administration, thank you very much, did a study that showed traditionally white names were 50% more likely to get a callback than traditionally black names when they were applying for a job using the exact same resume. And this wasn't just white people, even minorities discriminate against themselves subconsciously. And the point of this class is merely to understand that this is a reality and so that we can move past as a society. It makes no sense that a class so clearly helps students is generating so much debate. We need tolerance education at Los Al. Did you know that in my lifetime, we have had a skinhead problem at the school? Here of all places, where the leader of the Jewish club's car was vandalized because of her ethnicity. Here of all places, where anti-Semitic conspiracy theories were spread just last November, probably by some people in this room. Here of all places, where a student at the high school was beaten up for being gay, and the school was sued because a teacher showed footage of it to bully the student. Here at La Salle, where at a pep rally, a white football player ran into the stands and physically placed his hands on a black protester protesting the national anthem, forcing him up, stopping, violating his rights to protest and also uh, freedom of expression. None of that is normal. None of that should be normal. Here, where our old mayor was caught spreading racist emails, as a community that struggled with racism and all manner of xenophobia, we need to, as a community, denounce hate wherever we see it and instead preach tolerance and, more importantly, love. Please stop saying that this class is going to teach us that white people are devils. It's not. No one on this board is Malcolm X. Stop saying that this class is going to divide us into oppressors and the oppressed. That's not true. Stop creating a liberal boogeyman that's going to take away our rights. Critical race theory is not being taught in this course. And even if it was, it's literally just like what they teach in gender studies. It's not evil. Please take a look at the makeup of our school board and Andrew Pulver. Every single one of them is white. They are in favor of this program not because they hate white people, they are all white. They are in favor of this curriculum because they want a better education for every student. I want a better Thank you, Hunter. Thank you, Hunter. Our next speaker is Denise Inouye, followed by Charles Williams. Uh, could okay, we can please we have it quiet here? I'm ready to be speak. Respectful. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Since the passage of the ethnic studies course, many of the persons who spoke at the 4.30 p.m. meetings decided to look more closely at Ms. Reed's February night slideshow to try and get some information about this, what this course would offer. Ms. Reed's put a two authors in her slide, so an investigation was made. Two names, Christine Sleeter and Miguel Zavala. They were found to be liberal professors who ardently embrace and promote critical race theory. This theory has received a lot of news in the past days because of its highly racist and discriminatory beliefs. In a nutshell, its theory paints that all whites as evil oppressors and all non-whites as victims who are so oppressed by every systemically racist American institution that they can never get ahead. Wow. To subject our students to these ideals is nothing less than child abuse. White children are made to feel ashamed of their skin color, even though they have no choice over the matter. 
Non-white children are made to feel every institution is against them, and they have no means to get ahead. Ms. Reed has clearly demonstrated by her choice of authors which ideology she embraces. We have no doubt her selection of curriculum, along with the community she swears she listens to, will be selecting curriculum that embodies the same racist, critical race rhetoric of the author she chose to quote. I do not know if she's aware, but the inclusion of this theory goes against California State Board of Education obligation to not adopt instructional materials, quote, that contain any matter reflecting adversely upon persons on the basis of race, end quote. That's from code section 51501. Our group of concerned multi-ethnic parents also learned in a workshop that the board has hired Danielle Nava as a consultant to Las Lamitas to help train teachers in this ideology. The website states, Nava's consulting approach uses a racial equity lens and framework in all services offered. Quote, when a person from our group spoke with her after the meeting, she asked Ms. Nava what she thought about the critical race theory. And she said it was the umbrella over everything she did. So this board seems to have adopted an opinion that race is the dominant factor in every aspect of curriculum. We disagree in the strongest of terms. We are fairly confident Ms. Reed and the board members have decided already on the curriculum they're gonna use. We believe they are going to embrace the critical race theory. We are speaking tonight to let you know our future actions should it, such a decision be made. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker is Charles Williams, followed by Balin Herrera-Smith. Good evening. I guess I'm about the lowest form of human being there is on earth, according to the critical race theory. I'm an old white guy who grew up in the South, but I don't look at it that way. When I came along, my, my parents were both dirt poor as kids growing up in South Carolina on a farm. But one thing my parents taught me was to respect everybody, that everybody has worth, everybody is important. They taught me to say yes sir and no sir, yes ma'am and no ma'am to everybody. Didn't matter what color they were. It still doesn't matter what color they, they are today. We, I have two grandsons who live close by and I hate the thought that this curriculum could teach them that they are a flawed human being just by the color of their skin. Because when I see them, when grandma and I go to soccer games or gymnastics events, and there's 15 of them, my little guys, they don't, they don't pay any attention to what color anybody is. They play and, and have fun with kids of all colors, races, creeds, it doesn't matter. They're just people. And, to, and pe kids will do what you teach them. And if you teach them they are flawed by the color of their skin, and, and they are inherently evil, shame on you if you do that. There's no reason to do that. These, these kids are, are precious and every single one of them, no matter what his color is, should get the same opportunity and, and be treated equally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Balin Herrera-Smith followed by Julie Kizer. Thank you for allowing us the three minutes instead of the two minutes that you gave us earlier. First and foremost, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I spoke to you and now I speak to you in love, in God's love, that your eyes would be opened. Why would you allow or our um, children in the schools to chant and invoke a false fake God that is still dead, but won't let, you won't let our Christian children um, pray in the school to the only God, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead and is very much alive today. Praise Jesus. So I, I can't make this up. You heard it for yourselves. You heard the gentlemen here on the board and how they praise Miss Reed and Miss Nava. And even though they know what's exactly in here, that Christine East Leader's paperwork, all her stuff is in here, which she has been known to be critical race theorists. It's 
true. It's not a fact. Like the woman has there signs put up there that is just, oh, and she's, you know, she says truth, not facts. Well, this is facts. These are the 72 pages that are in here that, that, that the educators have put down. They said the ethnic study model curriculum, the ESMC, here it is. It's in here. Other people have went and did, they've done their homework. Please do your homework, people. Please do your homework. But this is what they've already said, what they don't want. These are facts that are in here, and the educators don't want it. But what has Miss Nava, Miss uh, Reed, and the rest of the board, what have they done? They've decided to, oh, never mind the facts. They've already made up their mind, and I say that again and again to those who missed it before. It's a truth, and so it is what we need to hear. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God is going to take care of our children because we have people that are praying. We have Christians that are praying, and no matter what you vote, God is still going to God is still going to protect them. You cannot destroy our children. You absolutely cannot do that. And no matter what your agenda is, it doesn't matter what you what you want to do because this is the thing. People who are listening right now, you have the power. You pretty much got the message at the beginning of this meeting when it first started, and they spoke a little bit about this. They are in agreement with Ms. Nava, how wonderful she is, and Ms. Reed. Okay, so you know pretty much what they're going to vote. They've already made up their mind. They agree with her. But let me tell you something right now. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. You, people can vote. You voted them in and you can vote them out. You know what their what their stand is and you have that power. And to God be the glory. God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power of love and of a sound mind. And I trust that you all are going to do the right thing. Even if the board doesn't do the right thing, Miss Nava, Miss Reed doesn't do the right thing, it doesn't matter. There's a, a wonderful um uh, it, it, there's things that are happening right now at the Christian Post where they are uh, doing ethnic studies and they're teaching white kids that Christians are evil. They're doing it right now at the WCSI, 1010WCSI.com. Check it out for yourself. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Kayser, followed by Larry Serna. Good evening, board. Um, my name is Julie Kazar. I've lived in Rossmore since 1979. I'm here representing, basically, I feel a nation, a state, and a community that I don't want to see become another statistic due to pressure and intimidation. Isn't CRT teaching reverse discrimination? And what has that solved, or what will it solve? We had a nation in 1939, Germany, who decided that the Jews were the fault of their demise. And what did that get us? Six million Jews killed. So turning the tables on white people for problems and teaching that color is what makes a person is so wrong. I actually have neighbors that are Middle Eastern Indians, Asians, Jews. I see these children out playing every day, riding their bikes, skating, and I don't think their parents have sat down with them or teachers and told them how to react to a person of color. I think these children look at people as people, as adults should be looking at people and not looking at color. And it just really upsets me to see why this is not being something that's uh, actually told to the parents or the parents should be teaching this at home. You should teach everyone to have respect for one another, regardless of color, regardless of ethnicity. And as one lady pointed out about religion, you know, the Lord said that we were to love one another and we were also to forgive one another. And it's a shame that that was pulled out of schools because we might not be in the mess that we're in right now. Anyway, I thank you. And I'm sorry I'm emotional. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Larry Serna, followed by Jackie Bond.
My name is Larry Cerna, and I am here tonight to voice my vehement opposi opposition to critical race theory being taught in our schools. I am here represent, representing the interests of my grandchildren, two beautiful, sweet souls who, are, who I do not want exposed to this harmful propaganda. Quote from Martin Luther King, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of the skin, but by the character of their content. Critical race theory, in fact, teaches children the exact opposite. It guides them to purposefully identify people by specific races and genders, something the left has supposedly fought against because it is racist. From what I have been able to research, CRT promotes and indoctrinates children into initiating the labeling of the, differencing, the differences between races, thus generating a base for racism in them that probably did not previously exist in their young minds. CRT promotes the hate of our country, divisiveness, identifying the entire white race as active racists and slave owners, Marxism, communism, and as an end result, racism, the very thing it is supposedly trying to end. CRT identifying Black Lives Matter as a benign, kind, nice, philanthropic civil rights group is totally leftist propaganda. <clears throat> they are a political organization that seeks to break down our democracy. The founders of BLM have self-professed that they are well-trained Marxists. This is a fact. Google it. A definition of Marxism, a political ideolog ideology based on Karl Marx's ideas, a political system based on Marxist ideology, is known as communism. Ah, another quote from Martin Luther King. I like them. I have a dream that one day little black boys and girls will be holding hands with little white boys and girls. Today I can only tell you in honesty that while my grandchildren are playing in the schoolyard, they don't see a black, brown, yellow, or white child. They just see a new friend to play with. Don't ruin that innocence and purity with this Marxist, leftist, propagandist garbage. Don't let our children be brainwashed and programmed as they did in Nazi Germany, East Berlin, and Communist China. Martin Luther King, I'll close, in my opinion, would not embrace BLM. His own daughter has spoken against it. They do not follow his path of unity and love. They want to destroy. In fact, they are the antithesis of his life goal, which for all of us to love one another in peace and equality. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker will be Jackie Bond. Our next speaker is Jackie Bond, followed by Lori Hernandez. Hi, my name is Jackie Bond, and I'm a senior at La Salle, and I'm as far as indoctrinated as it gets. My mom is a staunch Republican. My dad is very liberal. I'm Christian Catholic. I'm a leader of youth ministry. I'm white and I'm a woman. I've never ever been tested, been bullied for being white. I've been bullied for being a woman and I've seen every day, I've seen people being bullied for their skin color and that is not acceptable. And I think it is really indicative of the ignorance of that this class is trying to alleviate that people are associating politics and acceptance. It's not, self-identity is not something that can be debated self-representation and being your true self and being accepted for it and embracing it and, and being able to share it with your entire community is not a matter of politics. That is an ignorant thought. And I truly believe that we are not an ignorant community. We are a community of inclusion and it is not okay to, to stop this inclusion for people who who clearly, I mean, I've been booed in the room, who've booed many people here. I, I try and be civil, but I, I don't think the, the people saying things to me and other people about their views and testing them are really who should be deciding our inclusivity as a district. It's not fair for someone to boo on someone else's belief and then say that they are accepting of all. It's not. You are not. So thank you. I really hope that you pursue this further. And I hope that you see that this is not one race. This is not <laughs> the Eurocentric curriculum we've learned our whole lives. Ever since the beginning of history, it's not going to be a race by a single class. It's going to be brought in. It's going to be bring in all people. 
not just the people that that you see in the mirror, not just the white board members and the white members of our community, because it's for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Hernandez, is that Lori? Um, and then Arlene R. Hello, good evening, Hi, Dr. Pulver. Uh, my name is Lori Hernandez. I've lived in this community for 37 years. Um, in fact, my mom worked hard and relocated in the 80s so I could be in the Los Alamitos School District. I've always been very proud, graduated. Three of my children went through the uh, school system. One of them's younger, but I'm just, I came here earlier to learn and hear from, you know, the community. I've never spoken, and I have to be honest, I'm concerned with the, I, we want diversity. I, I don't know, I'm speaking for myself, but, I would like to look into the curriculum once I heard about, you know, where it's coming from. Is there other options or choices to consider? And it didn't seem very openly out there. I'm hearing things in the community about it now. I blindly just have always trusted our school district here and very proud to be a part of it. I'm just honestly at this moment, I don't feel that 100% trust and I worry about these young developing minds, especially our little ones, with, with labeling. And it almost seems like, what is the actual intention of this particular curriculum? So I just would beg you all, let's look further into where this is coming from. It seems like it's already passed. Maybe it's too late. I just, um, I want what's best for all the children and to feel loved and included and learn about differences and to see the children in the Weaver video, you know, how proud they are and they feel unity and they're not seeing differences. I am worried about what confusion it might cause them, especially the younger ones, being, you know, divided or talked about labels and identity is just concerning. I'm just, would it just beg you guys just to look further into the creators of this actual curriculum. That's thank it. you. Okay. Our next speaker is Arlene R., followed by Bill Andrews. Good evening again. Thank you for this opportunity. I spoke a little earlier to try to clarify the two topics. And I come back to, to see that people are making opinions, and it's so important that this, curric this particular curriculum is gonna be voted on. We have 30 days of review. But I think number one is this, just looking at this is not sufficient. This sounds good on the surface. It all sounds good. We can all agree to many, many concepts in this summary. But the most important is looking at the actual lessons, the actual videos, what is really being taught and how it's being taught to the children. And so in my research, I went, I went to this website and I want all the board members to take their time. If they haven't, please go to this because there you will find the videos. You'll find, uh, you'll find the lesson plans, you'll find the books and you'll see that it is absolutely calling oppressors and oppressed populations that the definition of race now has become two groups. And that's also in the standards of the state of California. Under this ethnic studies, one group is people of color and they are the, being oppressed. And the other group in race is white people. That's the new definition. And all things spring from those two conflicting power struggles it appears to be. So you members, are charged with voting and, and you have your day jobs. Not, this is not your full-time job. So I commend you for your effort in this, but please be a, an informed voter and all parents need to be in the loop here on the truth. 
and the truth resides in the details of this because that's what's being voted on. Just like when we go to the polls to vote on a proposition, we should study it, not just vote like our friend tells us to vote. So my request of the board members is to A, please do your studies and be a prepared voter before you vote. And when it comes to notifying the parents that we have 30 days to review the content of this, of this particular program, that then email all the parents, or you have many ways, four different ways to contact the parents easily. Send out an email and announce it. We have 30 days, parents. This is what we're voting on, and don't just look at the summary. This is the critical point I'm trying to make. Go to the website and look at the materials so that you can come informed. You may be for it, you may be against it, but in everybody I've heard, we're making opinions on something we haven't quite understood, and it's so important. I've been an educator for years, and, and I... Thank you. Thank you. Our, ne our next speaker is Bill Andrews, followed by Jacqueline Asbury. Good evening, board. Um, I want to thank you for doing so many things well. Um, I know you strive to bless the students in, in social and emotional development and creating an environment of joy and love in the schools. That being said, I think with the course of action that you're currently embarking on is absolutely the wrong thing to be doing. Because instead of, of bringing social and emotional development, it's doing the exact opposite. And bringing instead of joy and love, it's causing division and derision. Um, what I view this course of action is, is like a piece of bad fruit. When put in a, a, a bowl of fruit, the whole fruit, the whole basket gets contaminated. And so while you think this may only be a little step, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a major misstep in my mind. Um, I, it's also, I'm very concerned about this as being very, I am Christian. And I view this as being very anti-Christian, um, and that teaching, uh, teaching kids about chanting to Aztec gods um, is absolutely the wrong thing to be doing, because that is going to be, those chants, they'll, they'll carry on, they'll pass to their friends, their siblings, to your, maybe to your grandkids, and do you want your kids to be chanting Aztec things and to uh, non-existent non gods, or do you want them being go, go, embarking on a Christian path? Uh, for those of you who are Christian or Jewish or whatever. And so we need to really look at these things here, because once you embark on that, they're going to learn it. They're gonna, you can't undo it. Um, and so I appreciate what I appreciate your your efforts in this, but. Teaching somebody that their this color of their skin is makes them a bad person um, to a, a three, four year old, a five year old, a, a ten year old, a high schooler, whatever age. That's the wrong thing to be doing. And I, I think you can do the. the I know you can do better. And I believe I believe in this school district, and that's why we're here. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack, Jacqueline Asbury, followed by Lupita Ranger. Hello, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I didn't come prepared with anything because I wanted just to see how the night kind of unfolded. And from what I've observed is there is a highly organized group of individuals with a specific agenda in mind that have come here to speak. Many of the people who have come up tonight have not even identified themselves as a parent in the school district. 
I am a mother of two children in the school district who have come up through kindergarten and are, are now in middle school. And I feel like I have a very vested interest in their education. I'm uh, not somebody who's in some Facebook group or whatever that got a message from everybody and got all riled up to come down here and speak out against the ethnic studies course. Now, hopefully I can get this message across to everybody here. You are fighting an elective. If you don't like it, your child does not have to take that class. Do you understand that? It is an elective. So, and as a graduate of the CSU college system, if your child goes to a school in the CSU system, they're going to take courses like this. So this prepares them if they choose to take this elective. Please put that in your mind, it is an elective. Also, I want you to really think about where all of this organization and all of this, where does this come from that this group of people, many of which who have not identified themselves as having children in the school district, does this come from a place of fear or love? Where do these decisions, where is this coming from? Are you afraid? Because that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing a lot of fear. I'm hearing a lot of it's indoctrinating children. It's telling children it's going to do this, it's going to do that, it's going to do all these horrible things to our children. That sounds like fear to me. So think about that and think about where you're getting your information. If it's from a Facebook group that's feeding you all of this stuff to get you all riled up to come to a school board meeting, you just take a minute and step back. Maybe even take a couple extra minutes and just get out of your cubicle or whatever and meet your neighbors. Talk to the people in your community. We live in a diverse community. Our students deserve an ethnic studies coursework. And the social justice standards that was discussed at the, lo the last meeting, that is a framework that they are suggesting they will use to teach teachers how to talk about these difficult subjects. It's not a curriculum. Why are you talking about it as such? It is a framework. And last thing, Mrs. Williams is an amazing teacher. She was my son's fifth grade teacher and people need to stop mischaracterizing her. She's an incredible educator. Thank you, thank you. Our next speaker is Lapita Ranger, followed by Kim Frank, Frank or Frankie. You may want to implement this booklet, Social Justice Standards, The Teaching Tolerance, which is a project of the Poverty Law Center. If any of you have not looked them up, they've been in court nine times for hate crimes. That's not good. Do you want them teaching your kids? There's enough hurting kids by the pandemic because of not being able to be with their friends at school for almost a year. And you're gonna bring this nonsense to them? My goodness. Los Alameda School District is not a racist school. We've had many races in this school. I'm sure you parents see your kids hang around blacks, Asians, Hispanics, etc. There's no racial discrimination in the Los Alameda School Districts. Kids just want to have fun. They want to play in playgrounds. They want to have basketball teams or whatever sport they play. They know how to play with other kids or team members, not caring if one is black, Hispanic, or Asian, etc. The color does not matter to these kids. Let kids be kids. Color does not define who you are. Being different does not make you a racist. That's what's in this book, trying to make you feel like a racist. We do not need to put chips on the shoulders of our kids. After the crucial pandemic and when things are finally starting to get back to normal, Kids, keep the kids happy and interacting with their friends. They could care less about each other's color or religion. They are all human beings. They all go to Los Alamitos schools. And most of all, they are all Americans. That's what it should be all about. Why bring up the racial subject? We don't need a fight in school because of what number five says in this booklet under identity. Students will recognize the traits of the dominant culture. Really? Let me ask you, who's the dominant culture here? Am I the dominant culture because my last name is Ranger, I'm Caucasian, and I'm a Republican? 
or am I the dominant culture because my name is Lupita, Hispanic, and I'm a Democrat? I'm insulted by this whole thing, and you, so should you parents be, and your children. That is racist. And by this curriculum they want to put in the schools, well, what am I? Am I white, the dominant culture? Wait a minute, I'm confused now, and I'm sure your children will be confused. This is segregating, not uniting. In a nutshell, I can see this curriculum making every child feel disdain for their ancestry, just like how this is making me feel. It's victimizing the child and parent by manipulated facts. You are being bullied, people. Not being racially biased is not to see color. We do not need violence like the ones who wrote this social justice standards may have caused. If this is implemented in the schools, the project of the Southern Poverty Law Center, who has been in court nine times, for hate crimes will ruin your kids. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Frankie, followed by Catherine Yee. Yay, sorry. Hi, thank you. This is my second time up here tonight. I've, I've stayed around because I wanted to finish what I said earlier today. Um, it, it's just so important. Our, our children are so important. And this is about love, OK? This is about fear of our children. Learning an ideology is not true. But I'm here because of love. I'm here because of love. Just I, I, this woman. Um, but to remind you what I, I started out with, the critical race theory is what is undermining this social justice standards and all of this. And they call it, it's a movement. They call it a movement. And it's a theory that says race is not a natural biological grounded feature, but it's a social construct category used to oppress and exploit people of color. This is the basis of their teaching and the materials they promote and they use for their education that, that um, supposedly we exploit people of color. That's the basis. Now, our children aren't victors. They're not, victor they're not victims nor oppressors. They're individuals that should be responsible for their own actions. Responsibility should be encouraged in this school system. Bad behavior should be dis disciplined and not excused. So if somebody's bullying another, of course you're going to take action. You're not going to take action because they're a white oppressor and a black. No, whoever the really killed is, you're going to take care of it. But race is not a factor in this. If the kids are acting up, you need to take care of it and encourage responsibility. It's the job of the schools to educate, not indoctrinate. Children should be rewarded for their hard work and given A's only if they've earned them and rewarded for their character and hard work and merit. Children need to be not failed. They need to be failed if they're not doing their work and parents consulted. They not, they're not to be coddled and told that they cannot do it because of their skin color or victimhood. Now, the Bible, whose teachings have been largely banished in our schools, calls to love your neighbor as yourself, help others, work hard, be generous, help the poor, and develop fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you notice that none of this is about race? None of this is about skin color. I've heard some people tonight saying that they're glad that there are ethnic studies. Well, it depends on the construct of the curriculum, doesn't it? We already know the construct critical race theory is about being oppressed. So we already know that the history is going to fit that narrative, that whites are the oppressors and the other colors are victims. I implore you to stop and not incite hate in our children against themselves or each other. Let's teach them to learn using godly principles, character qualities. That's what they should be being taught. And I love what Ron DeSantis said. There's no room in our classrooms for things like critical race theory. Teaching kids to hate their country and to hate each other is not worth one red cent of taxpayer money. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Gay next, followed by Emmy Chan. OK, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Emmy. I am 13 years old. As you know, I've been attending the Los South School Board meetings and listening closely to the steps our district is and has been taking. I've also been sitting in the overflow room for the past three hours. I have taken note about some of the misconceptions others have about the steps being taken by our district. 
The first is the confusion between critical race theory and crit cultural response teaching. They both have the same initial CRT, but they are not the same thing. The district has never mentioned critical race theory, only cultural responsive teaching. The second misconception is that teachers are teaching anti-white curriculum. As a student, I personally know our teachers do not teach anything that would ostracize a certain group of people. I've been really proud that more recent curriculum is inc more inclusive for all. This year, I learned about our presidents and how, like me, they have their achievements and also struggles and aspects of their life. Or my sibling, Ellie, who learned about Women's History Month and the contributions of women and women across race and class in history. I didn't have that in fourth grade. I'm grateful Ellie has that opportunity. The third misconception is that ethnic studies is anti-white. Ethnic studies is the history of all Americans. It focuses on including the history and diversity of America. It's hard to sit here and listen to the anger in the room. I hope we can create curriculum that allows us to be kind to each other, where people don't boo or laugh as I and others are speaking. Can we help create a kinder tomorrow in our schools? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, thank you, Emmy. Um, Kathy then followed by uh, Maggie Marchese, and then la our last speaker is Peter Poloni, Polonis. Hi, everyone. I did not plan to speak tonight. I teach on Tuesday nights, but I've been getting a series of flyers sent to my door. They've been passed out every weekend to Los Al homes, Rosmore families, Seal Beach families. Look around to see who's speaking. How many are saying that they're family members and they're in our community? You all know I have a family. I have a child at Weaver. I have a child at Oak. I'm part of the Human Relations Task Force. As a working mom, I've heard how we've developed things based on the stories of our students and what they wanted. And as I want you to look at this notice, look at what's been said throughout today from many people speaking, most of them not identifying themselves, but the rhetoric is the same, modeling what's been said on there. What's troubling is they're asking for people's listservs. They're asking to be contacted regularly to spread more information. So as a person of color, can you imagine getting that at your door, saying that the school is promoting things like this and saying that it's, imagine how that feels. So who's here to speak? I hope you don't look at quantity because imagine who's scared to speak. I've, I felt scared for my child to speak. There is a lot of misconceptions that's being spread in that document that needs to be clarified. We've gone to the majority of the meetings and we sit in and listen after I come home from work at eight o'clock. One, the school's focus is on culturally responsive instruction. It is required by the state. The California teacher credentialing requires students and teachers, or teachers, student teachers, teachers to be trained on this. It is a requirement of good instruction. As to administrators, you need to make sure our teachers are well supported on that as well. It has 50 years of history. It has 50 years of research. As well, we know that the social justice standards is not just about race. When we look at what's happening here with the anger, with the confusion, the challenge to have conversations that's challenging, that is what the social justice standards is about. It's about anti-bias education with two components. One, to address prejudice of any social identity, not just race, class, gender, ability, status, all of that. And that's about all of us. We have all felt moments when we did not belong. And it's how do we have conversations around that? The second component about social justice standards, and you can go to the document and go on the website, it's about collective action. How do we build community so that us that are in the room do not see as we are against each other? I do not want to be in a school where people feel that we do not belong. Thank you, thank you. 
Maggie Marchese, and then uh, Peter Polonis. Let me fully identify myself for those who have these questions. Peter Pelloni is my, my name. My ch two children that I have, they started at Hopkinson when Mrs. Reed was there, Alexa and Anastasios. Um, and that's how they started their whole career. And first of all, I want to thank you guys for at least opening up the schools partially as we could when the rest of the state and the world have pretty much suffered through this. So I didn't come here ready to, to uh, address any matter. I'm just learning about what this is all about today, in the last couple of days. So I have a question. We're talking about ethnic studies here. How are we going to lump these? Since they're going to be an elective, my, child will have, my children will have to pick if they would like to take these studies. How do we lump them? Ethnic studies according to who? The white person that has a German background, a Persian background, a Greek background, an immigrant here, and I'm an American. But it was my choice to come here. My children are American first. The English person, the Australian, how do we lump the, the black community? Those who have Senegalese backgrounds, Nigerian backgrounds, um, Ugandan backgrounds, how do we do this? How about the Pacific Islanders? How about the Asian community here? The Cambodians or the Vietnamese? The Chinese or the Japanese? The Indian or the Pakistani? How do we lump these groups, these ethnic studies? Is it the Mexican or the Salvadorian? Is it the Brazilian, the Argentinian, the Nicaraguan? Who is it? Let's go to the Caribbean. Let's break that apart. Who is it within our groups? Is it the American Ch Indian Cherokee? Is it the, is it the Apache? Is it the Nez Perce? Is it the Navajo? Is it an Italian-American from Brooklyn? An Italian-American from uh, San Francisco? Is it a Jewish person that came from Israel? A Jewish person who left the persecution of uh, World War II? Different backgrounds, right? Different experiences. You know, we probably need 10 lifetimes to be able to start to understanding these ethnic differences, but you are lumping them, or from what understanding this curriculum, into color and race according to color. Let me tell you something. I got color. You got this? This is my color. OK? There ain't color only those who are we choose to have. We all got color, every single person in here. OK? That's how it is. So I want an answer on this, you know, just so I can dictate how my children maybe take these classes. Right? Do they want to learn about the Armenian or about the Assyrian? Huh? Tell me, North African, South African, where? Where do we start or where do we end with this? So let's figure out the agenda here. Thank you. Uh, we had one last card, Maggie Marcusi, did she leave? Oh, okay. Casey, Mark Casey, sorry. I wasn't planning on speaking again because I, I spoke earlier and we have a lot of people here. But I wanted to clear up some misinformation. Um, opposition is nothing personal. So we know that... Uh, the Deputy Superintendent of Education Services and the teacher on special assignment, we know they're great. Just like we know you guys are great. I mean, I moved here and invested and bought a home to, so that my kids can go to these schools. I love LoSal. And so it's, it's nothing personal. This is just parents that are digging deeper and that's what I would request of any parent listening or in the room dig deeper this is high level go to this is on the website teaching tolerance a project of the southern 
Poverty Law Center, tolerance.org. Go there, dig deeper. Don't just listen to the speakers here. Do your own research and make a decision for yourself. And in terms of misinformation, what misinformation? Everybody keeps, the, op the opposition keeps on bringing this up. This is your information. We got this from your website. This is not made up. No one is making this up. And no one is saying anything negative about Ms. Reed or the teacher on special assignment. Today we are addressing the social justice standards, not ethnic studies, for some people who might have forgotten that. And a lot of the speakers here are from the community. We have kids here, we have grandchildren here. We are not some Facebook group. We are parents. I don't want my son ever to tell me again that his teacher started out class by declaring that she has white privilege. That was this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public forum staff participation component of this uh, board meeting. We now move on to information and presentations. Um, we, uh, Mrs. Janet Murphy will be introduced by Mrs. Galicia. Uh, she will be presenting the uh, Measure K and Measure G Citizens Bond Oversight Committee report. Great. Thank you, Madam President. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Janet Murphy, who's our chair for the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee. No. No. Sir, the public forum is over, but you are free. Please, I would love for you to email me. I would be more than happy to address any of your concerns. Great. Right, thank you very much. I'm sorry, Janet. I'm going to go ahead and get started again. I I'm honored to present Janet Murphy, who uh, sits as the chair for our Citizen Bond Oversight Committee, who is going to be presenting our annual uh, report. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good evening, uh, members of the board and Dr. Pulver. Uh, my name is Janet Murphy. I know most of you, um, and I am the chairman of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, also known as the CBOC. The Citizens Bond Oversight Committee was established as a result of Measure G, a local bond measure, being approved by the voters in the November 2018 election. The passage of the bond measure necessitated the formation of the CBOC. So the district put out the call to the community for volunteers. There are 11 committee members, and each member submitted an application, sat for an interview, and was appointed to the committee by the Los Alamitos Unified School District Board of Education. The members of the committee are Craig Cartosian, Keith Crafton, Alexandra Ito, Ashran Jen, Trini Jimenez, Brett Lorber, Brady Metcalf, Lorraine Navarro, Marilyn Poe, Chad Stewart, and myself. The duties of the CBOC are threefold. Number one, to inform the public concerning the district's expenditures of bond proceeds generated under Measure K and Measure G. Number two, to review the expenditure reports produced by the district to ensure that bond proceeds are expended only for the purposes set forth in the measures and not for teacher or administrative salaries or other operating expenses. And number three, to present to the Board of Education an annual written report which shall include a statement indicating whether the district is in compliance with the requirements of certain sections of the California Constitution and a summary of the CBOC's proceedings and activities for the preceding year. Tonight, I'm here on behalf of our entire committee to present the annual report for fiscal year 2019-2020. Leading up to tonight, the CBOC held meetings on January 29, 2020, April 1, 2020, October 14, 2020, 
January 20, 2021, and most recently March 31st of 2021. The committee also toured the construction sites on August 28, September 22, and September 28, 2020. At our most recent committee meeting on March 31st, Brian Ruff of Ide Bailey, an independent auditing firm, presented the financial and performance audits for measures K and G to the CBOC. Mr. Ruff also answered the questions posed to him by the members of the CBOC with full and complete answers. The Measure K and Measure G 2020 finan final audit reports are available for review online at the school district website, lasal.org, under the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee tab. The website also contains other information on the activities of the committee. At the committee's request, the district has kept this up to date with all relevant information. Our committee would like to thank Dr. Andrew Pulver, Dr. Nancy Nien, CJ Nolan, Elvia Galicia, Myra Gonzalez, and Shoshana Dornblazer for their assistance throughout our most recent term. We have been provided with rapid responses to all of our requests for information. It has been a pleasure working with all of them to achieve our mission. At this time, I would like to present the annual report for fiscal year 2019-2020 of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee to the Los Alamitos Board of Education. And on behalf of the entire committee, we would like to extend our gratitude to you, the members of the Board of Education, and to all of those at the district who have been very supportive of us as we carried out our mission. Thank you. I was nervous. <laughs> thank you, thank Janet. You. Uh, before I ask if there are any questions, I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for your patience and um, waiting to be up here. And then thank you to your committee and to you for all of the great work that you're doing and the the reports and statistics and financial statements that you go through. Thank you for giving us resources to learn about more about what you're doing. Would anybody else like? Thank you. Uh -huh. okay. um, Janet, I do also want to echo what Dr. Uh, Mrs. Davison said. I do appreciate you. I know how much, I don't know exactly how much you do all throughout our district. I mean, I see you at the PTA council meetings, but I know you're active at the high school and I'm sure other places that I, if I just, open my eyes, I would see you. This is a really important committee um, because it's easy for people to say, we're going, we want your money and we are going to spend it in a good way. And it's nice to have some group of people check to make sure that that statement is correct. And I really appreciate the time and effort and the, the, um, the, the studying that has to go in and the thought process and the questions and all that kind of stuff. And I appreciate your leadership, and I just really wanted to say thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you. Mrs. Hill? Janet, um, thank you very much. I, I chaired this one uh, many years ago, a decade now, I think. That's a scary word to say. And it really is a big responsibility because, uh, and we really do appreciate what the committee is doing and what you're doing because we make a promise to the community that they are going to entrust us with a lot of money and their tax dollars and that they are... Um, that they will be over uh, overseen by a community group so that um, you make sure that we are spending them the way that we promised we would spend them. And so I very much thank you for your work, for your taking on this responsibility, as Mrs. Cattulli said, with so many other things that you do. And um, thank you very much for, for your commitment to our community and for to our district. Thank you. Thank you so I much. I personally oh. do want to um, thank Janet for her commitment as well. She is just an amazing chair. She really does make my life a lot easier. She's very committed, very dedicated, and just so organized, amazingly organized. So thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Scott? My youngest, my, well, I have two kids. My son is a sophomore. My daughter's in seventh grade. No, no, <laughs> no, but I, I might stay around and help even when she's off in college. It's a passion. I love Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I too would just like to thank uh, Mrs. Murphy, but really uh, every single member of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. So I know you're really representing all of them and you yes. run an incredible meeting. Uh, this is a committee that gives of their time in the evenings to help uh, oversee, uh, as Mrs. Hill said, uh, that we pledge 
to spend our, our, our taxpayer dollars for the bond in, in ways that we uh, clearly articulated and communicated. And I just want to thank all of them for their ongoing efforts. As some of you know, early on, we had a large number of individuals who wanted to be on this committee, and year after year, those numbers kind of seemed to dwindle. <laughs> so the fact that they are continuing to, to really be engaged and provide that oversight is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I will let them know, too. They are all appreciated. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you. So our next presentation is of supplemental materials, and Mrs. Reed, would you like to address that? Thank you, President Davidson. Tonight we are bringing forward formally the social justice standards, which will be on community preview for the next 30 days. The community can access those standards on our district website and download them to fully view them. If they log on to the website at www.losal.org, click on Departments, Education Services, the first tab has community preview resources. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Or I, One of the I things just... I just wanted to articulate is just to remind, um, we did present uh, at our last board meeting an overview of these uh, standards as they really are um, di different at each grade level and it's really about how, t how teachers can use these standards in a variety of ways to it, what they're al already teaching. So if they're already teaching a certain subject or a certain literature book or a, a lesson, this is just a way to anchor in another um, perspective within. We also intentionally tried to ensure that the community had ample time to provide their, their input and their perspective before the board approves this. So we will have three board meetings, this board meeting, the next board meeting in April, and, um, and then ultimately the, the first board meeting in May that the community could provide input. Um, so that it did not feel as though anything was rushed um, and that, that the community has the opportunities to both learn about it at our last board meeting and then three to provide input before all of you will make a decision of whether or not this should be adopted as a supplemental material um, for teachers um, should they need uh, find, find the need uh, within their classroom setting. Thank you and thank you for all the hard work. We asked you to do this and just like every project you take on, you put your heart and your soul into it. So. And thank you to all of the people who are working with you to make this happen and do this research and create the, the program. So thank you very much. We now are moving on to our quarterly report and Dr. Frazier. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to report uh, quarterly. We, we come out with our report of the Williams Uniform Complaints uh, and for this period of January 1st through uh, March 31st, 2021, we will have zero findings. Thank you, thank you. We're now moving on to our consent items. Our consent items are, are the business of the district and they're, and so do I have a motion? We have two pools, 10B and 10M. Do I have a motion for 10A, C through L and N? So moved. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The, the ayes carry it five to nothing. So I was the one who actually pulled both of these, and I appreciate any extra conversation from any of the fellow board members, but um, 10B is the approval to accept the grant application notification for funding of the Career Technical Education Incentive Grant. And from the, these grants, we've gotten nearly a quarter of a million dollars. And that money is so helpful, beyond helpful, in building our CTE programs. Uh, we've been able to do things over the years like replace uh, laptops that, need, that were old and needed replacement, but even more specifically, we've been able to buy desks that work well for, for project-based learning. We've been able to help support the purchase of, of equipment for, for our robotics and engineering teams. Um, Mrs. Hill and I, pre-pandemic, we're able to tour with the robotics team and see the incredible equipment that's been purchased through LAFE and other organizations, but a lot of it comes through these grants. So I'm deeply appreciative of the hard work that goes into writing these grants, and I think people, it's really important that people understand it is deeply impacting the students in the classroom, and it would be very difficult to find a that kind of money all the time within our own budget. So it's really important that these grants are, are, are written and we're very appreciative of the funds that come to CTA, CTE for it. Is there any other discussion? Okay, and then moving to, Oh, we, we have need to, to vote on that one. Okay, I move <laughs> approval. I'll second. Any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The five, it carries 5-0. So I was probably supposed to wait for the discussion, my discussion afterwards. You, well, <laughs> I'm it's still, a moot I'm, point now. Okay, so, yeah, but, yeah, but, but we should have, 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 have a motion now, first. Yes, okay, yes, now I, if, then you decide, we can practice I will on do this it one. right for M, okay? <laughs> so uh, on M, approval of an independent contractor agreement for an educational workshop. Do I hear a motion? Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Go for it. Um, so I, I also think it's really important in this time when people are, are feeling isolated. We are dealing with all kinds of new types of stress, and where some of us have dealt with depression and anxiety. That there, that this district, whether it's the PTA, whether it's the district, whether it's um, independent, if it's choices made on each campus. Uh, or it's another group, there are workshops being provided by Human Relations Task Force, all of these groups, to give us the opportunity to, to be educated and supported in areas of concern, whether that be how to support our, our kids during the pandemic, whether it's, uh, I attended via Zoom, two of Dr. Weichmann's, and I learned so much about the importance of, uh, of disciplining, of having discipline and monitoring screen time for our children, the detrimental effects of too much screen time. I mean, these are really practical workshops that can help parents and support families at a time when we feel like we're sort of stuck in our homes without any help. So I really want to thank all of the organizations that make these possible. So um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion carries 5-0. Moving on to our action items. Our first action item, item is A, approval of the district-wide systematic, oh sorry, schematic solar site plans. Um, Mrs. Galicia? Yes, thank you, Madam President. These are, this is the approval that we are seeking for the eight um, locations for the solar arrays that uh, Mr. Nolan presented earlier today. Okay, do I hear a motion? So moved. A second. Is there any discussion? Um, I would like to thank um, Mrs. Galicia and Mr. Nolan for the work that they have gone to for, to create this. I, when we were going after our first bond, I brought up solar, and that was <laughs> in the dark ages of solar <laughs> energy. Decade. Yeah, where it, um, it was at that time considered not financially beneficial to the district because um, at, at that time the, the technology was just beginning that we wouldn't have really generated enough electricity. And so every time we come up with a bond, I wanted solar energy in there somewhere. And I, we put solar energy on our house. And I, it, you know, an investment should theoretically pay itself off or be profit within three years to be considered a good investment, sort of what I've learned in my life. Um, and well, we're not paying it off in three years and what we're saving, but um, I love my carbon footprint. And I just, that it's occurring because of the solar. And I've been very supportive of this. And you guys found a way to do it so that we are, we're better carbon footprint creators and it's not costing the district anything and we're locking in a good electrical rate for the future. So in the future, we will definitely also financially benefit from this. So I just want to say thank you for you guys for being so creative. Thank you, Ms. Catulli. Unfortunately, I cannot take credit for that. It's uh, really Myra, CJ, and of course, Dr. Pulver, who were instrumental mm -hmm. in uh, getting this going. So yeah. thanks mm -hmm. to them. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any further discussion? Yes, and I, I do also want to um, thank staff for a, just a great job and such an, um, a thorough job in choosing where to put them and really taking time to make sure, because these are going to be there for 30 years, yeah. it's a long time, and um, and we really want to be good stewards to our community as well, and so I really do appreciate all the efforts put forward uh, to actually go through that vetting process, and then also uh, just to make sure that it's clear that we have, um, we are approving the plans without Oak and McGaw at this point in time because we are still working on those. So, um, but thank you very much uh, once again to your staff and Dr. Pulver. Thank you, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so um, do I have a motion? Do we, have a, do we do the motion? I moved, yeah. We did because we, we discussed. Okay, um, all those <laughs> in favor meeting. say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion carries 5-0.
Our next I Resolution, our next item is adoption of a resolution to increase the um, levy of special taxes within our community by the board. And Mrs. Galicia, would you like to address that? Of course, yes, thank you, Madam President. This is our annual resolution we bring to the board for approval to increase our Mellow Roos special uh, parcel tax to increase it by 4.75%, which is a re the, the allowable percentage. Thank you, do I hear a motion? So moved. A second. Is there a discussion? Um, I would like to say something. This is the Mellow Roos tax that That's was correct. originally passed in 1990. Yeah, 1991. That's what I, I actually worked on that. I have to keep thinking. One was my 35-year-old in kindergarten, <laughs> um, so it's hard to do the math quickly. Um, so it, uh, this is just on that one bond. It raises it uh, approximately $10 a year. And the reason why we do this is so that we can pay off money that we've borrowed against it so that we're good stewards of money and pay our bills. And thank you for identifying the $10 because when you yeah. see 4.75%. Where's that? Yeah. Of what? Yeah. Of what? <laughs> yeah. Ten, it's about $10. <laughs> thank you. So this is a roll call vote. Shoshana, you want to? Mr. Forehead? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Katuli? Aye. And Mr. Uh, Fayette? Yes. Oh, no. The vote carries 5-0. We move on to approval of warrants, and warrants are the bills we pay every month, and they are large. Um, so <laughs> do I hear a motion? So move. Second. Is there any discussion? Just want to make clear that um, we do go through all 46 pages, I believe, this time. And if we do have questions, which I think we all did, uh, we get answers to those questions. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries 5-0. Um, now we get to address acceptance of donations, which is just a very wonderful part of celebrating our community. The don donations come from individuals, groups, um, organizations. Do we have a slide for that? Can you, well, I think she's trying to pull it up. Thank you. So you were trying to stall. Oh, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So as you can see, we've got we have um, donations in terms of an Eagle Scout project. Uh, we have from uh, Pacific Life Foundation to Oak Elementary School PTAs, um, McGawhead from Bright, Bright Funds, and Friends of Weaver. The total for this month is twenty five thousand five hundred fifty six dollars and thirty cents. In a time of a pandemic, when when everything is stressful, we are completely shocked by, maybe not shocked, but very appreciative of the generosity of our community. Our total to this year was over $434,000. Thank you. Um, do I hear a motion? Or did so I move. All those in, is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No? Okay, good. Not me. Uh, carries 5-0. Uh, finally, we're moving to communication. This is where the board. Uh, actually, we in. have oh, one. Oh, oops, more. sorry. That's okay. The classified moving along as fast as I can. <laughs> Dr. Fraser's big moment. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> Dr. Fraser. I've been waiting for this all night, okay. Madam President. <laughs> actually, so have we. <laughs> so, without further ado, Madam President, I'm bringing forward both the classified and certificated personnel reports as presented. Do I have a motion? I move. A uh, okay. Any discussion? Thank you, Dr. Frazier. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion carries 5-0. Now we move on to communication from board members. And Mr. Fayette, would you like to start? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have no idea what happened since the last board meeting. <laughs> uh, I did stuff, went places, mm -hmm. saw people. The district is incredible every time I see the uh, the kids brings joy to my heart and really makes it all worthwhile. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the comments, and I just would just recommend to people is to be civil. Whether you agree or disagree, listen. You might learn something. I learned today, and I have about six pages of notes that I've got to go back and look at and review, and I just would be be civil, these are our neighbors, 
This is our community. We do strive to be better together. And thank you for everyone who participated. Thank you, Mrs. Catulli. Okay, that's hard to follow. Um, I wanted to point out that you did participate in the high school principal's interviews because I, we were on the same panel. So, um, so that's what Mr. Fryat did. Um, I actually have two pages that I had typed out beforehand that addresses the fact that Los Al um, Unified School District did not go back into traditional day or the, actually, in my opinion, it was a modified traditional day schedule because I felt there was a lot of misinformation out there. It's been a very long meeting, and I'm not going to read it because it would take too long, and it's, like I said, it's two pages. Um, but I just wanted to say that it was a very multi-layered decision. It was not pivoted on one idea alone. Um, and you, and uh, I understand the frustration of the parents who really wanted their kids back. I have been saying since last year, I want our kids back, and I still want our kids back. But it, this was not the time, I feel, for us to have done that. And I understand parents' frustration, And but, you know, so contact me, and I'll let you read my two pages. Um, other than that, I would like to give a little report on ROP. Um, our North Orange County Regional Occupation Program has made an agreement with Fullerton Elementary School District, and this is within their middle schools. They have contract contracted with um, ROP to have what they call Extended Play Wednesday, and I just love the name. Wednesday is also uh, Fullerton's early out day, and so on. in their middle school campuses, um, they're having different programs, and so ROP is, is offering culinary arts, American Sign Language, sports medicine, and theory introduction, because these kids are in middle school, uh, digital photography, uh, medical assisting, and EMT and fire technology, kind of like a very much of a, of a survey so kids can, you know, try several of them and see if they might be interested in. And I just thought that was um, a really good thing, and I wanted to share that. Um, I was able to do my walk through, through McGaw and participate in the high school principal interview panel. Um, um, I always love going through McGaw. That is my home school. My kids went there. My grandkids went there. And I'm looking forward to all the kids coming back there. And my one comment about our principal interview panel, one of the reasons why I really like being on the interview panels is not because I think I can make the best decision on the best candidate, but I like to get a feeling on the pool of applicants. Do we have qualified, dedicated, impassioned people who want to take on the daunting job as our high school principal? And I was so pleased with the group of people who we were on, that we interviewed as part of a panel. And the final decision um, is going to be something good for the entire district, so I'm happy about that. Uh, for California School Boards Association, I was on a Zoom meeting for bylaws, and um, one of the really wonderful things that I did is that we I had a Zoom meeting, not me personally, but with other people from Orange County, had a Zoom meeting with uh, State Senator Umberg. Um, he requested this. We had, I'd had a meeting with him like maybe three or four weeks ago, and he had to leave And we, at the end of it, and we were in the middle of it, but it was the end of the time allotment, and he wanted to speak to us again. And... The thing that I found most exciting is that I really feel that he was looking to school board um, board members and superintendents who were on the Zoom meeting as a resource for him to get some really good information. And he was like, he said, real quickly, who's 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 using the, the, the incentive money? I don't think, I think one school district raised their hand. No one else was using the incentive money, either because they were already partially opened or whatever the incentive money was going to do didn't really apply to the school district. And he's like, he was just asking really pointed questions. And so I was just very happy that I could participate and I hope I've represented LaSalle in a very good way. That's it. Mrs. Mrs. Hill? Are you there? Okay, good. You did that too. See? Thank you, Madam President. Um, so I, I had a pretty busy couple weeks and so I did have the opportunity. I was asked to speak at the uh, Seal Beach Republicans Club and um, I would say that there were some really good questions and I hoped that I had um, 
shed some light on some topics uh, after this evening. I'm not completely sure I did a very good job, but I did my best and I did my best to represent ourselves. And I will tell you that there were very, very many people who came up to me and were just very grateful to hear about what was going on in our schools. We're so grateful for them opening up and that we would open up and, 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 and take the time to come and speak to various groups. And I think any time that we have that opportunity, it's great for us to be able to do that. So, um, I was grateful for that and then um, was part of Longevity for Weaver. Um, I uh, embarrassingly so say that I got my first walk in, walk through in this year, and that was through uh, Rossmore, and it was just amazing, and it was so good to see students in school, and they were so engaged, and just also the consistency through um, age, uh, through uh, grade grade levels and what was in the classrooms and what was being taught and what was on the walls. And, um, I just really appreciated it. And, um, Amy has a new last name. Colty, Colty. um, was just so incredibly, um, such an incre incredible, uh, host. And with Dr. Pulver, we had a, a really good afternoon. It, uh, I love their feeling wonderful. Uh, my husband and I had the wonderful uh, evening of jazz by the Los, um, Los Al Jazz Band and uh, just was, they did such an amazing job um, pre presenting this um, on YouTube and um, it was the last show, I believe, for the seniors and they all got their chance to have their spotlight and to talk about their uh, journey through music in La Salle, and it was uh, very, very heartwarming. Many of them had had Mr. Padilla in middle school and then through high, in, in high school, and so um, that was a, a, a wonderful way to spend an evening. And really good music. And um, uh, I also want to say that I appreciate Ross Moore Living Magazine. Uh, they put articles about our district in there, um, every time, and this one was about Hopkinson, and if you haven't had a chance to look at this, please do, and I appreciate them giving us that space uh, to be able to share the good news. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, as Dr. Pulver presented, um, school next year. And I think that um, there, there's not one of us, I'm sure, that um, are, is, are not happy that our students aren't in school in a traditional format. But I really believe that our goal is to make sure that they are back to normal next year. And um, I just want to thank staff for what they did for this year. It's always, it's always kind of funny because um, you're your successes don't follow you for very long. So we had parents so grateful for us for getting students back into school and so on and so forth, but that only lasts so long and then they want the next best thing. And so, and I understand that and um, appreciate that and, and know that we are gonna really finish this year strong and um, get into next year. So thank you everybody for making that happen. Um, I had the opportunity through um, Zoom to go to the Chalk Mental Health uh, Seminar, and uh, that was very inform informative. Um, it was over Easter break, so I'm not sure they had as great attendance as they would have liked, but it's really nice that we have another resource as well. And uh, watch La Salle football. Oh, my goodness, we, we score a lot of points in the first half, especially. So i uh, very proud of them. And then I just want to say that I, uh, I want to thank my fellow board members. And I was really honored that I was elected to the uh, CSBA delegate assembly. And so thank you for your support. And um, I hope I do you proud, but I know I have a really good mentor sitting right next to me. So that's it for me. Thank you. Mr. Forehand? Yes, uh, I, one of my favorite weeks at Lee School is start with hello, and the kids get to do all kinds of activities around making sure everybody feels included and with kindness and respect. And then I got to finish up that week by reading in Mrs. Haygood's Low Sal at Home class on Zoom in her classroom. She invited me in, and I left 
thinking, my goodness, how these teachers are managing this low sale at home program. I just, I was amazed. So here's to all those doing it from home. Um, Dr. Pulver already took over on the academic bridge summer school. I thought that was a great idea. Uh, middle school, I think they're celebrating ability awareness week. Maybe it's this week or next week, but you know, they're taking, there's programs like differently abled musicians where the kids are getting to watch about that. Uh, I love the longevity. We got to do Hopkinson today and we did Weaver. Um, the spotlight program, Diana, was incredible. And then maybe end on, it's always good to hear about our great kids. Uh, the Rossmore Women's Club chose two students for March and April with scholarships, Andy Fong and Jack Munson. And you can read all this academic achievements and just be in awe. But what caught my eye is things they do that are extra for kids. And they go, um, I think it's Andy who does a magic show for growing up STEM to our elementary kids. And then I think Jack last time, well, I don't know what summer he got to do it, but it was a K-8 Excite summer camp for the arts. And gosh, that's great. And then Alexandra Magana, $500, the Guy Jones Honor Thespian Scholarship from the high school. So it's a nice way to end with kids. Yeah, that's what we're all about. Okay, so I'm going to keep it fairly brief. I, I, I want to say that the, I agree with Mrs. Catulli. The interview panel yeah. uh, for principal was absolutely incredible. Um, there were so many qualified people that were supposed to rank them, and it was just really impossible to put anybody anywhere near the bottom of a ranking. They were all outstanding, just really brought a lot of quality ideas to the table. I'm very excited about our choice. Um, for the I thought, One thing I'd like to say about the walkthroughs is I'm, I'm completely stunned by how beautiful everything is. We talk about, I've talked about the classrooms and how the kids are engaged, but really honestly, I, I think back to those 1940s movies where the lady has the white gloves on and rubs and there's just not a spot. I mean, our custodians, our workers, our, our, the whole entire staff taking temperatures, making sure everybody's healthy. The, everyone on every campus is doing everything they can to keep us healthy, happy, engaged in learning, and keeping it very, very sparkly. I'm just always astounded by the cafeteria. I really think they have them delivered because the kitchen looks like it's never used. It's just yes. unbelievable. Um, and then I want to say thank you, along with what Mrs. Hill said, for the music. <laughs> Stan and I got a nice little date night with that jazz. It was very wonderful. I, I'm completely astounded by the talent. And and Mr. Padilla is a magical man. He It was really a wonderful night. Um, sports, I'm so thankful to have the sports open. Uh, but I do have one thing to say, and that's that I would like clarification. <laughs> Once again, I'm asking for clarification from the county and state. I don't understand any kind of how we are so inhibited in, as to how many people can come when if, if we can only allow two family members in, that excludes like grandparents who are, have been excluded from everything and won't have decades of opportunity. And they are the ones that are, are, are vaccinated. So they're vaccinated, they've, been, they've stayed safe. I, I, I believe that the state and the county need to clarify and open that up. Um, I, don't, I don't think that when you look at the way the world is running, when you look at fair, uh, full, fair, full airplanes, when you know that by June 15th, the state's supposed to open up, that I hope that for graduation, for our graduations, I hope that we can be more inclusive. And I think that there's really not a reason why we can't. Um, and finally, I, I'm very thankful for all of the, um, the community participation. Um, I appreciate it when people are respectful. Uh, I, I think there's, a, there's confusion. And once again, as that young woman shared, CRT, if you Google it, can be critical race theory, but it can also be culturally uh, relevant teaching or it can be culturally um, responsive teaching. And we've even tried to get that, that, that idea across by changing teaching to critical 
our uh, culturally responsive instruction. So we, as that last gentleman asked us if we've already approved cr critical race theory, it's not on the agenda. So I, I just wish that people could calm down and listen and, and be aware that we are listening to what they have to say. This is a work in progress. We, this is the first eth ethnic studies group uh, class in our district and, and we are all working together to come up with the best answers. The other idea is that if, if we weren't to do it, the state is probably most likely going to mandate um, that there are ethnic studies on, on our campuses and then it'll be their curriculum. The thing that LaSalle can be very, very proud of is that during Common Core, we developed our own curriculum. We tailored our curriculum to the intellectual ability levels of our students. We tailored it to the, the climate. We were very specific in, how, in, in work together to come up with the best curriculum possible, which was way better, in my opinion, than what the state offered. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate that woman who said, trust, trust the district, because we only have the kids' best interests in our hearts. It, we are a public school, and so invoking or implying that I personally take, uh, res I resent the idea that I'm godless or that I oppose God. I work in a public school where we embrace all beliefs and we honor everybody's differences. But um, to think that I never pray is just not true. And I, I really pray with all my heart that every single one of us are able to find the right answers and when we make mistakes that we'll figure it out and, and work forward. So that's the end of mine. I just really thank, thank, thank Mrs. Reed, Mrs. Williams, and everyone working with you to, to do this good work. Thank you. We, I think we are going to move into closed session for a few minutes. So, yes, we still have some uh, other items uh, under closed session that we need to uh, meet and discuss. Okay, thank you. Um, and we have to sign some of this. Everybody has one paper to sign. Are we going?